I was brought up as an Orthodox Jew and a Zionist. On a shelf in our kitchen was a tin box of the Jewish National Fund into which we put coins to help the pioneers <coughs> building a Jewish presence in Palestine. I first went to Israel in 1961 and I've been there since more times than I can count. I had family in Israel and I have friends in Israel. One of them fought in the wars of 1956, 1967 and 1973 and was wounded in two of them. The tie clip which I'm wearing is made from a campaign decoration awarded to him which he presented to me. I've known most of the Prime Ministers of Israel, starting with the founding Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion. Golda Meir was my friend. So was Yigal Alon, the de Deputy Prime Minister, who as a general won the Negev for Israel in the 1948 War of Independence. My parents came to Britain as refugees from Poland. Most of their families were subsequently murdered by the Nazis in the Holocaust. <coughs> My grandmother was ill in bed when the Nazis came to her hometown of Stashov. A German soldier shot her dead in her bed. Madam Deputy Speaker, my grandmother did not die to provide cover for Israeli soldiers murdering Palestinian grandmothers in Gaza. The present Israeli government ruthlessly and cynically exploit the continuing guilt among Gentiles over the slaughter of Jews in the Holocaust as justification for their murder of Palestinians. The implication is that Jewish lives are precious, but the lives of Palestinians do not count. On Sky News a few days ago, the spokeswoman for the Israeli army, Major Leibovitch, was asked about the Israeli killing of, at that time, 800 Palestinians. The total is now 1,000. She replied instantly, Five of them were milit 500 of them were militants. That was the reply of a Nazi. I suppose that Jews fighting for their lives in the Warsaw Ghetto could have been dismissed as militants. The Israeli Foreign Minister, Tsipi Livni, asserts that her government will have no dealings with Hamas because they're terrorists. Tsipi Livni's father was Eitan Livni, Chief Operations Officer of the terrorist Irgun Svai Leumi who organized the blowing up of the King David Hotel in Jerusalem, in which 91 victims were killed, including four Jews. Israel was born out of Jewish terrorism. Jewish terrorists hanged two British sergeants and booby-trapped their corpses. Irgun, together with the terrorist Stern Gang, massacred 254 Palestinians in 1948 in the village of Deir Yassin. Today, the present Israeli government indicate that they will be willing, in circumstances acceptable to them, to negotiate with the Palestinian President Abbas of Fatah. It's too late for that, Madam Deputy Speaker. They could have negotiated with Fatah's previous leader, Yasser Arafat, who was a friend of mine. <coughs> Instead, they besieged him in a bunker in Ramallah, where I visited him. It's because of the failings of Fatah since Arafat's death, that Hamas won the election, the Palestinian election in 2006. Hamas is a deeply nasty organization, but it was democratically elected, and it is the only game in town. The boycotting of Hamas, including by our own government, has been a culpable error from which dreadful consequences have followed. The great Israeli Foreign Minister Abba Eben, with whom I campaigned for peace on many platforms, said, you make peace by talking to your enemies. However many, many Palestinians the Israelis murder in Gaza, they cannot solve this existential problem by military means. Whenever and however the fighting ends, there will still be one and a half million Palestinians in Gaza and two and a half million more Palestinians in the West Bank who are treated like dirt by the Israelis, with hundreds of roadblocks and with the ghastly denizens of the illegal Jewish settlements harassing them as well. The time will come, not so long from now, when they will outnumber the Jewish population in Israel. It's time for our government to make clear 
to the Israeli government that its conduct and policies are unacceptable and to impose a total arms ban on Israel. It is time for peace, but real peace, not the solution by conquest, which is the Israelis' real goal, but which is impossible for them to achieve. They're not simply war criminals, they're fools. Welcome to The Daily Wrap-Up, a concise show dedicated to bringing you the most relevant independent news as we see it from the last 24 hours. Saturday, October 14th, 2023. Thank you for joining me today. Now, I wasn't actually planning on doing a show today. I've been pretty relentlessly focusing on this topic because I think it's monumentally important. And I was planning to take a little bit of time to kind of refocus, organize some other topics that I plan on getting to, taking care of some personal stuff. You know, when you just focus 99% of your time on work. But of course, I saw some things that I just couldn't put down. And I'm realizing how, not just like I said, important that this topic is, but how how earth-shaking what's going on truly is in so many different ways. And it's a, in regard to the Palestinian people and what they've been str- struggling through for 75 years plus or to the general reality of international law or lack thereof or the supposed leaders of the free world who are actively doing all the things they pretend other people are doing and in some cases they are also doing i mean it, it's a little I'm, I'm watching in real time as we're watching you know fairy tales and, and illusions shattered and it's it's a really positive thing while so much tragedy is taking place at the same time like it's a, it's and, and this is one conversation to to be had and, and really just for you to dis, to think about is as much as I, I will never condone acts against civilians, violence in general to carry out a political end outside of the idea of being an occupied territory, the le- things within the law, which armed rebellion, armed resistance is legal for an occupied territory under the Geneva Conventions. But the idea that despite all of the horrors that are being carried out against the Gazan people, the, the Palestinian people, which, by the way, is the sole responsibility and fault at, of the Israeli government, regardless of what happened before that. They're the ones carrying out these actions. And I'm going to go through a litany of people from the U.N., international law and human rights groups that will all tell you exactly the same thing and bring it right back to the law. But the point being that many people over the years have argued that the reason these actions are taken, even knowing that there will be consequences, is because they've spent 75 years trying to get you to pay attention, Try spent almost you know, 75 years plus, trying to get you to notice that they are being stepped on, that their lives have been destroyed, that they've been stolen from, that they get raped and murdered and displaced on a regular basis. And very few people care in the context of the corporate mainstream conversation. And now, interestingly enough, people are paying attention. Conversations are being had that we've never been able to have before, even though they're rooted in fact, even though they literally are objective reality. It's 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 again, that is a good thing that people are finally beginning to see through the illusion. But at what cost? And my point is, that's ultimately for them to decide. And it seems to me that most Palestinian people support what's going on, not the response of the occupying power, but the, the act of trying to fight for their freedom. Now, that in no way, even according to most Palestinians that I talk to, condones the attacks on civilians, which clearly happened to some degree. But we're going to get into a part of this today that does definitely add some doubt to what really went down. And this is based on people from inside Israel, almost predominantly Israeli Jews, speaking up and saying, we were attacked by our own government. Now, I'm not even sure if I agree with the way it's being presented, but it's a really interesting perspective from people inside Israel while our government's telling us that everybody's on the same page and we have to support them. There's a bit bit of a different conversation going on. There are people right now protesting, which I'll get to to call for Netanyahu's resignation because of him propping up Hamas. And these are people that are in Israel, Israeli Jews, who have people held by Hamas, and they're calling for Netanyahu's resignation. We're not being let to told the entire story. Now, the point that what I was making in the beginning is that because of these actions, and even because of the unparalleled, unprecedented genocide being carried out by Israel, Israel's government, that has opened people's eyes. 
And so there's a level of that that people are saying, this is what we've been fighting for. And not at this cost necessarily, but point is that a lot of people out there think that this is the only way to get this done in the sense that we need to act because people won't pay attention if we don't. And again, that's most people talking about legal actions within the Geneva Conventions. I'm talking about the context of the original uprising, and nobody should be condoning civilian attacks in any context, in any location, wherever they're, whatever their ethnicity and whatever they believe. Of course, it's interesting how that statement is being framed as terrorism, whereas the people saying only one side matters are presenting themselves as the altruistic side of this argument. It's unnerving, to say the least. Now, the opening clip you saw there is an older clip, a little bit older, and it's from the UK, and this is somebody who you can you heard him discuss this. I'll play it a, a little bit more in the show, where he's talking about, or actually, no, I think I just saved it for the beginning. I'll, here, I'll just bring this up while I talk about it. Here's the clip that it, this is from, uh, not the Tory, Tory graphy, not sure really the count. Gerald Kaufman was a Jewish member of parliament who served in government under multiple prime ministers in, in the UK, including Colgan and Wilson. His vast knowledge on the Israeli-Palestine situation was what influenced other, others in labor, including those his close friends, Jeremy Corbyn. Of course, which people will go, oh, anti-Semite, except that's wildly false. Another person who's understanding the history here and has been calling it out. And even once this all started, his stance was, I condemn attacks on any side. And that frustrated people that wanted him to come out and be seen as the person supporting one side as that's what the other side is doing. It's, it's confounding. But the clip was important because he's telling you about the history as somebody who is very pro-Judaism, very pro-Israel, and seeing now as it turns around where the thing he thought he was fighting for is the very force that is now acting, in his words, as Nazis. And that's alarming. And we're going to finish today with an overlap of the part of Zionism and its interesting connection to Germany and Nazis and that whole discussion, because this is something we need to understand. And it's it's documented history. You can look it up in WikiLeaks or excuse me, Wikipedia. Not that ever, as I've always said, means that it's real, but it means mass adoption. That's something that apparently everyone's OK with being just stated as app. And it is the truth, by the way, The as he said in this clip, the terrorist origins of this discussion in regard to Israel as a state. Now, this again, as 90% of what we're going to talk about today is going to bother people who want you to think of this only as the narrative that there's a good guy and there's terrorists, and we're getting rid of the terrorists. Interestingly, sounds a lot like what we were told in, after 9-11 and the war on terror, or what we now know as the war of terror, that predominantly killed civilians, that went on to occupy countries, that destabilized many nations, and destroyed the lives of untold millions of people around the world for an, uh, an arguable objective, especially when we now begin to see that it's been aimed at us the entire time as Americans from our government, and it just took another phase as it went into the COVID-19 conversation. But that's for another discussion. Today, we're going to start with a clip or a post from the Times of Israel. Dan Cohen posted this as well. Now, and, you know, that, that I, maybe I didn't say it in general, but I think the whole point was today's focus is on what's going on still in this ongoing genocide and conflict, but also the kind of overarching points that of, of, of the main legalities, right? The idea that this is unprecedented, that what's happening is a targeted attack on the Palestinian people. And I'm not, I'm not talking about the original incursion into Israel and what happened to the civilians. These things can exist at the same time. We need to be able to acknowledge that what's happening right now is genocide. And that does not in any way undermine or overshadow or ignore the fact that Israeli civilians are being hurt. The fact that somebody tries to make you think that and make you pick a side between civilians, those are the bad guys. And I just mean that in a general sense, bad people who don't want to care about civilians because of a political agenda. Again, the def actual definition of terrorism is carrying out violence to, to achieve a political end. Remember that, as all of our governments do that on a regular basis. But we'll go through a lot of this today and show you the true face of what these people are and what they're talking about, the origins of Zionism in regard to the creation of the, uh, the state of Israel, and a lot of other stuff in between coming from people that, before all of this, were the only people you were supposed to listen to, and now apparently they're all Nazis. Just like that. So here's a post from Dan Cohen, correspondent for Redacted, journalist, uh, you've, and you've, you've seen him before, I, I respect him. In March 2023, Israeli parliament passed a law paving the way to conquer the Gaza Strip and reestablish settlements, illegal settlements, nowhere in the world other than, you know, kind of 
unspoken, like the United States turning its eye and acting like we assume they're following international law like they're doing now. And the and and Israel believe that these settlements are allowed. And the, really, the reality is Israel doesn't even think that they just don't care. The United Nations and pretty much everybody have acknowledged that the increasing taking the settlements, the com- continued displacement, the bulldozing of homes under the guise of building a park are it's illegal. It always has been. And it's never stopped being illegal. They just continue to encroach and continue to take more land from the Palestinians. So his point is they wrote this article, which is, by the way, right here. March 22nd, 2023, we will retake Gaza, it says. Hardline minister, so part of the government, hails repeal of West Bank disengagement. So he says, or this is the, it was his quote, at the end of the day, in the article, the sin of the disengagement will be reversed, meaning we're not, we're going to not engage with the, you know, occupied, the remnants of Palestine that still exist within occupied Palestine, or rather greater Israel proper, excuse me. We're going to get into the greater Israel point. Israel proper is what I meant. He says, I don't know how long it will take. Sadly, a return to the Gaza Strip will involve many casualties. Think about what's happening right now. Ultimately, it is part of the land of Israel or occupied Palestine that they want to turn into Israel, which is the real history. And a day will come when we will return to it. That was March of this year. It's very interesting to think about now that we're watching this literally take place. Now, there's a couple of things we need to get into in regard to how this went down. Obviously, they were bombing for five days or up to a week until they suddenly said, hey, let's get you out of the way because we care about you. Untold amounts of civilians are still counting. Thousands of them have been killed. Civilians. Not even counting the supposed 1,500 Hamas members that were killed during the incursion. That's a separate number. We're talking thousands of, at the very least, what I can, coming from human rights groups and the UN and plenty of others, oh, up to, it looks like about 700 children and about 400 plus women, independent of the 1,500 number they're telling you about Hamas. Realize that. That's over a thousand provable children, women, civilians, comparable to what I guess they say is, uh, I think, what, 1,400 plus Israelis who were killed, a number which they refused to let us know how many were IDF members, which tells me something which in no way does that undermine the reality that civilians were killed and nobody should condone that. But facts matter. And there's an interesting reality how we keep getting these blunt numbers. Here's how the Palestinians and here's all the Israelis. Well, wait a minute. How many Palestinians are civilians in that number? And how many Israelis over here are IDF members? Those things are very relevant. And interestingly, we're being withheld that information. And don't forget, even uh, Air, uh, what's her, um, Fengen, I forget her first name, who we're going to get to in the end, from, she's in Israel. She's the one telling us that Israel themselves are letting them know that we're withholding information from our own people. Something fishy has been going on from the very beginning. And may it may well be this was ex- executed as she believes, which, by the way, would argue they allowed people to be killed to do it or did it themselves. That's their opinion, by the way. That might have been done in order to achieve this end. Don't forget, we just showed you an article from, I think, a couple years ago that said they found billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of gas reserves under Palestine. Very interesting in regard to these specific locations. But the point is that if they wanted to take this territory back, how could they have achieved that? Right? Because you know there's going to be pushback. These are civilians. There's going to be a problem. Well, we know that Hamas, if we don't, if we remember, according to the everybody, Wall Street Journal, the information, the reality, the objective truth, Hamas is created by Israel and the United States, and they still have allegiances in some degree to those places. So I think that there is something to be discussed. Again, the election he mentioned in 2006 is not the standing today. There's never been an election since. We're talking about the idea of Hamas, which was one aspect, and then there was the debate between Fatah and Hamas. We talked about the Doha agreements, which kind of stalled. And now we're at a point where there's no election. And the Palestinian Authority seems to be the real ruling faction, which Robert argues is the tool of Israel. And I think most Palestinians agree. So when they continue to go, Hamas is the government, even though we are we know they created them, even if you want to pretend they lost control of it, the point is they're responsible for what they point at as the problem, which is pretty common tactic when you come to Western foreign policy but that they're using this to achieve their ends. And it's not actually the controlling faction, in my opinion. I think there's people that do support them clearly, but ultimately that people that it's not a simple conversation. And then on top of that, I keep asking the same point. Do you really think that a group that is openly saying that most of these people are terrorists, which we'll show you even more today, would then turn around and let them elect their government? Call me a conspiracy theorist. I find that hard to believe. But they're going to retake Gaza few months later, it appears to be happening. 
And if you want to read the rest of the article, it's it's just more of the same. Now, what's going on today, to just kind of start with the newest developments, the U.S. is requesting delays to the ground invasion of Gaza, according to the, according to many reports. The United States has requested a delay until the establishment of a humanitarian corridor. Right, and you know why we should be disgusted, insulted, almost laugh at how macabrely stupid that is? Because they let this go on for a week and then said, oh, hey, wait a minute. Maybe we should allow them to get out of the way before you carpet bomb the entire densely civilian populated area, one of the most in the world. It's, I mean, that's how, think about how insulting that is. I mean, let's make the same point with Israel. The fact that you pretend like now you want to get them out of the way. You And by the way, as they're even saying you have 24 hours to get out of the way, they're still bombing civilian areas right now as we speak, continuing. Even the, I think it was the New York Times said they've been bombing around the clock. There's, a, there's entire like city blocks that are lay, raised to the ground. It was Lindsey Graham that said level it all, didn't he? How can you possibly pretend that he didn't mean the civilians too? I mean, these people are maniacs. So now they're saying, oh, wait a minute. Now we want to look like we care about civilians because clearly we've lost control of the narrative. And clearly people recognize that we're murdering everybody there. So let's wait, hey, let's get them out of the way. And I promise you, once this goes farther down the line, they're going to pretend like that was said first. And then it just happened and then we lost the fog of war or whatever. They let this go on for a week before they even spoke up about getting them out of the way. And let's not forget, by the way, we just told you this. The State Department memo that was leaked says... They'd want nobody in the State Department, none of their diplomats, who, by the way, the only job of a diplomat is to reach resolution, to de-escalate. They said they want no talk of de-escalation. We don't even want you mentioning the word de-escalation. That's what they told their government as they were carpet bombing civilians. Don't even bring it up. Is that a government that, what, that now goes, whoa, hold on, let's give you a corridor and get you out of the way, when 30 seconds before that they were saying, don't even bring it up. This is how dishonest these people are that we're dealing with. Now, let's start with a New York Times article that came out today. Israel sticks to call for Gaza evacuation and readies a possible invasion. Now, realize that what they're saying there is that's because pretty much every international body is saying this is genocide. This is terrible. What you're doing is in a war crime. You can't just displace millions of people on a dime with nowhere to go, with no assurances for safety or food or water or whether they can return. This is unparalleled, guys. I mean, even I mean, almost arguably in consideration to the very first time, because now we're at a time where this has been so they have been doing this for 75 years and now just to step up and act like they're doing it for them. I don't even know how they thought this would fly, even with the support of all of the Western governments, which, by the way, to per my title, should really show you where they stand when it comes to human life, international law, human rights, civilians, anything we want to talk about. It says the United Nations and others condemned the call for more than a million people to leave. They've been saying this for, the, for days now. Israel, of course, just said, well, well as, the, as the title says, they softened their initial timeline, which is not even really what happened, because really early they said that they, when they said they have 24 hours to leave, Israel responded by saying, no, we haven't even put a deadline on it, which to me does not mean that could mean longer, because if you truly understand what they have done and what they continue to do, for example, with the maritime rules, pretending like they have, a, so, like legally they're supposed to have so many miles into the ocean to be able to fish. They break that on a daily basis, and the, the distance changes. So it could be one mile, or it could be two miles, it could be five miles. They don't know. So they venture out hoping to feed their families and get shot because, oh, that day it was only one mile. That's a real thing, and you can easily look that up. And the point is, that is what they do to ensure these people get killed, in my opinion. I mean, how else do you rationalize that? I mean, th so the point here is we're talking about pretending there's no timeline. So how what these people go, oh, okay, well, we don't know when we're supposed to be out of here then. Meanwhile, just in case it's unclear, they're continuing to bomb these areas. So it's not like they're giving them some window to leave. And we're going to get into it again. It's now been verified by multiple agencies. They directly bombed people on the way out. They said, go out over here. And then they bombed them on the way out. There's not even a narrative that there was Hamas there. Nobody's even talking about it because it's really hard to defend. Here's what it says in the New York Times. This is from yesterday, excuse me. The United Nations International Aid and Rights Groups called Israel's directive unworkable or unlawful and urged it to rescind the evacuation. What point in history have we ever been in this time or in a position where 
any of these groups, any of the Western clout, you know, these people that are in the club, right? Where they come out and take an action and everybody says wrong, illegal, unlawful, remove it immediately. And then not only do they not do that, if that happens, then everyone supports them. All these supposed high-minded international rules-based international order, right guys? Every single one of the people making, saying that phrase is backing what's happening. France, the UK, all of them. Only, weirdly enough, all of the supposed bad guys around the world are standing up and going, what about human rights? What about the civilians? What about international law? Terrorist. Now, I'm not making it that black and white, but it's really interesting to see that divide right now and recognize who is showing themselves to be the real, at the very least, morally ambiguous people. It says a UN spokesman said in a statement that the evacuation could not be conducted without devastating humanitarian consequences. So that's directly from the United Nations. Regardless of whatever your narrative is, we're doing this to help them. The point is the United Nations stood up and said that action you claim will help them is going to cause, quote, devastating humanitarian consequences. And they act like that's the alternative. So stay here, get bombed to death because because of what X, whatever they say the narrative is. Because there's no one investigating to see if there's Hamas in locations they're killed. They're bombing everywhere, guys. It's provable. That's why people are speaking out. Then they say, but go over here. And we may bomb you on the way, though. And we won't tell anybody about that. But then if you do even make it out, the UN is saying this is going to end in devastation anyway. Does this seem like a way that's working out for the average civilians? Every single part of this is a, is a war crime. Collective punishment. I mean, everything from across the board. This is disgusting. And they say it could transform what is already a tragedy into a calamitous situation. Too late. Far too late. It says, but many others remained out of a necessity, fear, or defiance. Now, they're really desperate to make this out to be some human shield conversation, despite the fact that even the UN in the past has disproven that in regard to what's going on with Palestine. But when we've talked about this already. On top of the fact that Robert himself has done these investigations and disproves these allegations, on top of that, we can prove to you, as we've done in this show already in the last week, that Israel has an open policy of using Palestinian children when they engage with other Palestinians. That's called a human shield, guys. Or the fact that they already used the Palestinian cages, which they said were Israelis, or and it turned out to be Palestinians they were holding in cages. And they know, oh, we'll forget about it then. <laughs> we won't even talk about it if it's Palestinians. Exactly. Or the 400 to 600 U.S. citizens trapped in Gaza that are only just now being mentioned by the U.S. as of today. And still, they're bombing all over. I guarantee you they've killed Americans, and they're not even going to care about that. As long as they're Palestinian Americans. It doesn't matter. They've made that pretty clear. The point is, to argue that Hamas is making them stay there is wrong. It's a lie. It's not true. And you can hear this from the Palestinians. You can hear this from Hamas. But of course, I wouldn't take their word for it either. But on top of that... The statement that they're pointing at to claim that's what they're doing, simply say, do not give up your homeland. That's not saying we're going to force you here for human shields. And that becomes this broad blanket statement that anywhere they bomb or anybody they kill was because Hamas was there. That is cowardly and it's childish for people to take that excuse, especially since you know damn well you can't prove it and you're simply taking a side. And then to call us bad people for asking for evidence. Like, this has become inverted. This is a very alarming situation. Many of them are speaking up, and even the New York Times is telling them, look, they're there because they want to. Fear, defiance, necessity. Israel, quote, will continue to operate with significant force in Gaza City, it says, and will make extensive efforts to avoid harming civilians. Right, after a week of indiscriminate bombing, according to every human rights group and the United Nations and everybody else. But if you listen to Israel, you're, a big, you're anti-Semites and you're lying. Which one do you think makes more sense? Every single group that 30 seconds ago was on the other side of this argument, now going, you're killing people, and they just became anti-Semites, just like that. Isn't that interesting? Or is it more likely that they're very clearly, verifiably killing civilians at an unprecedented level, and they're pointing that out? And then the only thing you can say is racism, because what else are you going to say? No, we're not killing those image, the videos of babies coming out of the rubble. That's not us. That I wouldn't surprise me if they tried to make that argument. The point is it's happening. And all they're doing now is going, we're doing our best or pretending we're doing our best as they literally arm or aim at them as they try to leave. As it's not just independent media reporting this, guys. We'll get to it. Human rights groups and international institutions that condemned Hamas's assault in Israel also criticized the Israeli response, including the evacuation directive, the bombing campaign, and a complete blockade that has prevented fuel, water, food, and medicine from entering, and refugees from leaving, and shutting down electricity service for Gazans. 
right? So as they go, go, leave, get out of here. The point is the actions they're taking are, dem are making sure they don't, including bombing the crossing, which now almost every corporate outlet has admitted Israel did. It's, it's getting very difficult for them to get away from how obvious this is. This is become this is straight up terrorism. And that does not mean that what happened in the civilians in Israel is condoned. Isn't it interesting how they're always that's what keeps happening. Even people in powerful positions, every time it gets brought up. But we have to remember they have a right to defend themselves. Everybody does. OK, moot point. Keep going. And that they kill people. OK, we, nobody's denying they kill people in Israel. That is unacceptable and they should be held accountable for it. But I'll tell you what, if you carpet bomb the entire area and we can't even find any way to investigate, the point is at the end of the day, it all becomes moot. Because, like, for instance, with these allegations we're going to get to later about people who were supposedly shot, but you've got people in Israel telling you that they think your, their government was responsible for what happened. How do you piece that together? And then how do, you, and how do we investigate when there's no evidence to be had because everything's been destroyed? It's very interesting. Now, it says uh, healthcare workers, international aid workers, and journalists were among those that were killed in the bombings. So think about this. If the New York Times is writing without, quip, without caveat, without asterisk, saying healthcare workers, international aid workers, and even journalists have been killed in the bombings by Israel in Gaza. How in the world do we not see what's going on? How does anybody pretend that's what is are Hamas using them as human shields? Clearly not. I just showed you a Reuters journalist in Lebanon yesterday. They got killed. They haven't even barely reported on that, even though it's very clearly the fact. We know he died. We know he was there. We know Israel bombed right there. Pretty simple. And then on top of that, it's obvious because other people tell you who was there and saw him die. The point is Israel's bombing just killed a Reuters journalist in Lebanon. And according to the New York Times, healthcare workers, international aid workers, and other journalists throughout Gaza. And UN workers, children in the schools at the UN schools, their pupils, the teachers. This is all provable, verified information from the highest level, and it just keeps going. I mean, I really am kind of blown away by how this is happening. I've never been in a time where I can read the New York Times and be like, oh my God, they're writing it right there. They killed journalists. Simple as that. Even, realize that even if it was like they were aiming over here and it was a wayward missile, there still was accountability for the fact that they murdered a journalist or even accidentally did. But they don't even, that's not even the conversation. Where's the United States standing up and condemning the killing of a journalist? Where's anybody doing that? This is, this is very revealing. Quote, the horrific attack in Israel cannot justify the limitless destruction of Gaza, says the International Committee of the Red Cross. Think about that. That they're blatantly telling you what we're saying the horrific attacks in israel which we're all acknowledging do not justify the limitless destruction of gaza which is undeniably what's happening right now while your government pretends like it doesn't matter it tells you something about who they really are adding that the call to evacuate northern gaza literally violates international law period you know why because it does it's as simple as that but nobody seems to care in the rules-based international order Another relief group working in Gaza, the Norwegian Refugee Council, said the evacuation amounted to, quote, the war crime of forcible transfer. You know why? Because it literally does verbatim the war crime of forcibly transferring people somewhere else that don't want to move via force. Redundant, but you get the point. I mean, think about how crazy that is. It's right there in the surface. And what's their narrative? Well, there's bad guys there. Well, there's bad guys everywhere. I mean, think about the knowledge. Think about the idea of any number of Western wars. So they go over, they attack these people, and they say, well, there's bad guys there. Does that ever justify murdering mass-scale civilians? They've tried, but the point is there's all sorts of accountability. That doesn't actually ever get to them, but that also shows you the same level here. These governments are all doing the same type of thing. The difference here is that they're now acting like this isn't the same thing. That it's some kind of weird special category where they have a different type of right defense. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, I'm going to get into an analogy in a second about the reverse and the, the hypocrisy of it all, right? I mean, how about the idea that if the United States or any other government goes into a war and starts killing people and their people while on the ground commit a bunch of atrocities, which, by the way, happens every time. You go through any U.S. war, you'll find an untold list of atrocities committed by either individuals or directly from the power structure. Okay, so that argument, based on what they're saying today, invalidates anything they're doing. Right? Isn't that what they're telling you? That Hamas went in and killed civilians. That way, that means that nothing that happened is even considered. Well, that's not the case. Because the action was legal under Geneva, Geneva Conventions for an occupied territory. But then there were crimes committed. See my point? 
it's not equally applied. I can point at every single war that these Western countries have committed and show you atrocities in every single one of them. So by their logic, none of those things should be valid. And you know what? Truthfully, many, many of them aren't. But that's a different conversation. While Israel directed Palestinians to go to southern Gaza, its forces were striking sites there too. That is right in the New York Times. While Israel was telling them to go to these places, they struck those places too. How do you pretend that's not a war crime? There's no, we're not talking Hamas. We're talking directed, and here we are, here, now we have it, targeted civilians. Just because they keep trying to pretend like there's no targeting. They just don't know where they are. Well, that's because that, that's just the same. Bombing an area indiscriminately is the same, or not knowing where they are and not caring is the same. But now it's even more specific. You're targeting them as they leave, according to the New York Times. Israeli airstrikes had killed at least 50, 70 Palestinians and wounded 200 others who were simply trying to flee the northern Gaza in vehicles on a main highway to the south. There's video of it. I'll show you one of them today. It's confirmed by the New York Times. It's confer concer confirmed by the Associated Press, confirmed by NPR, confirmed by me, by Vanessa Bailey, by human rights groups, by the United Nations. But yeah, let's pretend like it's all anti-Semitism and we're all being lied to and only one side matters. Does that feel like that makes sense? Or do you feel like we're being lied to? 70 Palestinians who were trying to flee because they were told they could take that route to get out were killed. As assuming they could even make it out, by the way, because when they were doing this, they were bombing the crossing and Egypt wasn't allowing people to pass for very clear reasons. Not that I'm agreeing with them, but they were very clearly stated. Quote, it says, we can't lose sight of the fact that the overwhelming majority of Palestinians had nothing to do with Hamas and these appalling attacks and their suffering as a result as well. This is from... Uh, Pres uh, oh, that's, of course, for President Biden now trying to walk this back, right? So seven days go by where they're indiscriminately bombing civilians. Now, suddenly you have now you care about them. You know what that shows you? They're losing control and they know we see it. So they're trying to act like they care and act like they've always been doing that from day one. It's not true. These people are cowards and, quite frankly, murderers. The crisis reverberated far beyond Gaza on Friday, a day that a Hamas leader had declared a day of rage for its supporters around the world. Here's something really embarrassing. So apparently in their rush for the story, the New York Times can't even do their due diligence, due diligence enough to find out that he was a former member, a former leader, not a leader of Hamas. But this is going to confuse a lot of people. So this guy speaks up as a former member of Hamas and says, let's have a day of jihad. And I went over this yesterday. The word jihad is not what people say it means. Even more so, we have to remember that the word and what we associate it with in regard to suicide bombings, for example, it comes from the U.S. backed forces and the creation of ISIS and Al Qaeda and the rest of it from Israel and the United States, provably via the receipts that you can prove in the many different overwork, the Al Qaeda documentaries we've shown you from James Corbett. Ben Swan has an outstanding documentary. The point is, it's easy to verify if you just care to look. I know it's a scary topic, but your government in Israel very clearly created the groups they're using to scare people around the world. Saudi Arabia has admitted it more than once, and they're involved. The point is that those are the people that were acting like that and then using those words to get you scared about the world in regard to the Middle East. Now, I'm not saying that there's not people that carry out terrorism in other cases. I can prove a lot of them. We're looking at some right here, in, case, in fact. My point, though, is that the word simply means, I mean, let's do it again since we did it right there on the show the other day. Same thing with the word intifada. People actively don't understand what these things mean. This simply means, it literally means striving or struggling. Right. So, of course, you could literally argue that it would be you, you could it could be used in that sense. But people simply talk like, for instance, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad is just a Palestinian group. It's called the Islamic Jihad. And all that means is a strive or a struggle for for the Islamic culture. But, of course, we want to contort that into something disgusting. And, of course, this is going to really anger all the people that only want to make every Muslim or Arab some kind of terrorist. Like we showed you the, uh, the other day, and there's, there's plenty of them, except what's interesting is they're the ones calling us racist. My point is there's a lot of misunderstandings. Now, first of all, this guy, remember, was not actually a leader of Hamas. So it's very telling to me from a group that was created by Israel and the United States. This guy steps up and goes, do bad things around the world, which there was some statement about that that seemed like violence. But then the word, of course, the day of jihad becomes something that makes it out to be we're all going to be attacked around the world. And didn't happen, did it? There's a bunch of spare, sparse events that seem to have happened. They're trying to kind of patch together what they claim this was about. They, what, they really want you to think there's some kind of massive Hamas worldwide attack, and it's not the truth. Quite frankly, if something happens, my opinion will be that it was executed by the very same people that are telling you it's going to happen. That's just my opinion, though. 
You know, if we haven't wrapped our minds around what 9-11 truly was and things like that, then we're just not paying attention. The crisis, it says, reverberated far beyond Gaza on Friday, a day that, oh, I just read that part. This is as the, in the West Bank, Israeli security forces killed eight Palestinians in clashes on Friday. And security was stepped up in cities around the United States. So for those who don't understand, the West Bank is not Gaza. The West Bank is one of the other, it's one of the two lasting locations left that were the original Palestine that are dis associated from each other because that's on purpose but the west bank is part of israel proper it's not in a open air prison but it's since all of this has risen up more it's happened in the past but since this has all been happening west bank has started to the palestinians lots of them in the west bank have started to push back which is now causing an even more of a difficult security situation for israel but the point is during all of this there's even been get this eight, otherwise it says eight palestinians uh where was it hold on the number killed right there so they, so if we're pretending this is only about Hamas and human shields, right? What happened to the eight Palestinians in the West Bank? Was Hamas tying them to their shoulder? No, we're talking about Palestinians in the West Bank who are being shot by Israel forces, which, by the way, has been happening a long time. Now, yes, some of them are acting in, with violence. The point is that we're talking about a wholesale situation that's being kind of summed up with one little small narrative that doesn't meet all of what's happening. It's just inherently dishonest. And an Israeli diplomat in Beijing, that's what I was talking about, was stabbed, not fatally, on Friday, a day after Israel criticized China for not condemning the Hamas assault, because everyone around the world has to have the same opinion, right? Because that's what makes sense. Of course not. In France, a man the authorities said was under surveillance for suspected Islamist radicalization killed one person with a knife and wounded two others. The authorities didn't offer a motive. Well, wow, what a, what a day of jihad. Clearly, that was what we were waiting for, right? I mean, that's, these are some little small events. Who knows if those are even connected? The point is, that's, the, that's what they want you to think is happening and rising. Not the New York Times necessarily, but the kind of narrative that's being spun to say this is some kind of rising event. U.S. officials said they were looking for ways to secure the release of hostages taken by Hamas to create a safe zone for Palestinians. Yeah, after seven days of indiscriminate bombing, where we can tell you, I think the reports are plus 20 plus hostages they claim have been killed. Israel denies it, of course. How they could possibly know that is beyond me. Of course, they would never admit that they killed their own hostages. So, of course, they're going to deny it. But, of course, Hamas would probably say that, too, if they wanted to make a narrative about it. But it's pretty easy to suggest that there's – if they've indiscriminately bombed, which we can prove they have, it's not hard to wrap your mind around the fact that people have been killed that they didn't plan for, right? So I think it's easy to show which side makes more sense, but you know, wait for more evidence. Now it says uh, and to, to get humanitarian relief into Gaza and evacuate foreigners who are trapped there including some 500, 600 Americans. That is the first time outside of NPR that I've seen any other platform mention that. And I've yet to see any U.S. government entity say, we're worried about the many civilians in there. Maybe I missed it. But it seems like they only care about one side of this argument, which really disgusts me. And I included this again. I put this out the other day. Simply pointing out, if you care about the American citizens killed or still unaccounted for in Israel, but could not care less about the over 400 American citizens in Gaza right now, per the U.S. Embassy, while in Israel indiscriminately bombs, you're likely a terrible person. It's not hard to understand the difference there, right? As I said the other day, one's largely Palestinian Americans. The other ones are, I can almost promise you, Israeli citizens, American citizens, dual citizens on both sides. But it's interesting how one side's not being talked about and only one side's really being tallied. But they're telling you right there. They want to create a safe zone for these people after they've been bombing for seven days. Israel and Egypt, Gaza's only immediate neighbors, which have imposed a blockade on the impoverished territory for 16 years, much longer than that, have refused to allow people to cross their borders in the past week. Israel, too. That's the important part. Egypt has said it would allow relief aid in, but the only border crossing from Egypt has been effectively sealed by Israeli bombing. That's a crime, guys, and nobody even talks about that. They bombed the crossing as civilians were crossing and after they told them to leave. And they bombed people leaving in their cord, in their, in their, uh, car their, their cars and their trucks. But what's crazy to me is what it's saying right there is not only to bomb the crossing. Uh, where it was, um, hold on, what was the other part? I just lost it. Egypt said it would allow relief in. Oh, well, that's and the, the relief that they're trying to at, bring in is the other point they're making. It won't, it can't come in. So as much as they keep pretending like they're allowed, they're, and they're not letting people be helped that need help. 
King Abdullah II of Jordan meeting with Mr. Blinken. And this is more than one person, by the way, of, of people in the Middle East that are standing up and saying all civilians matter while Blinken, like a complete Jack A, nods his head while actively saying the opposite everywhere else. Saying he warned against forced displacement and influencing collective pun inflicting collective punishment against Raza Gaza citizens. So that what my point is, is that people like Blinken who sit there and, and go along, yes, yeah, we care about civilians, and then absolutely don't do that. Absolutely go along with whatever Israel's doing and give them all the support they need and even cheer them on as they continue to bomb, which is what's happened. Shows you how disgusting these people are. Israel's conducted a far more intensive bombing campaign of Gaza than in previous conflicts, which it says is aimed at Hamas and, again, according to the New York Times, but which Palestinians and aid groups say has mostly harmed civilians. The Gazan authorities put the toll at 1,900 people killed, about 7,700 others wounded, and many more whose homes have been destroyed. They, that's one of the parts people don't talk about. Just the, the argument like that, just because you think that you can get them out of the way, what about their homes for the third time being destroyed, right? I mean, it's, just, it's, it's unparalleled to think about what they must be going through. Out of more than 2 million Gazans living in an area about the size of the city of Philadelphia, the United Nations says that more than 400,000 people have already been displaced. That's a war crime. Forced displacement. Quote, notice the small-sized bags. Oh, this was the point was they, some, some of these journalists, of course, as we're watching all of this come out, happen in the Gaza Strip right now, watching all of this take place, video upon video, I'm not seeing any of these corporate journalists make a big point about that. Yet here Israel calls them over and brings them in to come look at the things that have happened before. Now, I'm not trying to diminish what happened to Israeli civilians, but why are we still focusing only on that part of the story while this is continually unfolding? That shows you something. Both matter, but they're only covering one. I think that's very telling. Now, the point is they brought them in and it says, notice the small sized bags. They are children and babies. The smaller bags are of their body parts, which I think is important to note. They never saw anything but bags. Now, that's going to frustrate some people, but I've been showing you the stuff, the, the topic about this story and that narrative that's been walked back by nearly everybody, but weirdly continues to go forward. I'm not saying they didn't kill innocent civilians, but as Robert points out, and I trust Robert's due diligence more than most of these people, and my own, by the way, that I don't see any evidence of children being killed, not yet. And if we do, we'll talk about it. I do see evidence, at least video, of what appears to be children or at least like teenage, younger children that were taken by Hamas. Or rather, and this is interesting, by the way, that video that went around of Hamas with children. I don't know why we assume that means they took those children. It could be, sure. But it looks to me like that was Hamas going around doing what they were doing and just not being cruel to those children. But again, it's the point is there's no context. So we don't, and they, what they want you to do is assume, and that's why one side puts it out and says, Look at how they did look how they didn't hurt children, which is what it looks like. And then the other side comes out and goes, they're holding children hostage. And yeah, sure. They look like they're smiling, but then the people go, oh no, they're holding them as human shields, which is that's the narrative on the other side. Well, you know, well, why don't we wait for context and facts? If the children don't get hurt and they weren't holding them and it turns out that way, well, then we should talk about that, but they'll never admit that. And we should wait for facts. But according to Robert, Vanessa Bailey, and plenty of others, this is something that they argue that they're, are, that they're not, that the body, not individuals that might act of their own accord, wouldn't do. But that's for you to decide. It says the Israeli military said on Friday that allegations that it had used white phosphorus were unequivocally false. So this important, I'm glad this followed that claim right there, because that's provably true. There's been four different videos that unequivocally, even according to munitions experts, said that's white phosphorus. They use white phosphorus, and that's why I had this up. It's not even that hard to wrap your mind around, seeing as how the Human Rights Watch has already covered this in the past. Israel's unlawful use of white phosphorus in Gaza. It's a very obvious thing. And yet, they just said, liar, fake news. So let's think about that as some of the other claims might also be lies, or they might also be pretending they didn't do something that they did. The, the group Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International had said that there was evidence of the white phosphorus today, and Israel had used white phosphorus, an especially potent incendiary whose use in populated areas would be, by, violate international law. And I love how they just move on from that, right? So is, if you were a real journalist, you would at least write another paragraph to talk about the fact that Israel's denying something that the human rights groups say they have evidence for and claim happened. But no, of course not, because that's not, they're not in the business of challenging long-held beliefs. It just makes me mad. 
obviously it's happened. And obviously the human rights groups say it happened. And Israel just goes, nope. And then we go, we're not sure. That's not objectivity. That's just ignoring it, acting like there's two sides to something when you have evidence and then one side denying that evidence, not the same thing. Now, proof, I should say, because it is proof. You've got the groups proving it happened and you've got the evidence, the videos showing that it happened. Hamas terrorists are hiding in Gaza City inside tunnels, they say, underneath houses and inside buildings populated with innocent Gazan civilians. This is what they this is the narrative they're spinning to justify the mass bombing of in, in, indiscriminate bombing of civilians. Now, the point is, even if what they say is true, it still does not make that allowable. That's something that all the people around the world are saying, the human rights groups, the United Nations, experts in international law are saying there's, it's a crime, no matter what. That's a war crime, what they're doing. Just so you understand that. It doesn't matter how much, much you scream and how much you talk about what happened in Israel. It's a war crime nonetheless. And by now, it's exponentially worse than what happened in Israel because of how many more people are being killed in the context of the, the volume of death. Individual death matters, as I've said the whole time. But to watch this continue, it's just becoming... I mean, I don't even know a word to describe it. It's over the top. But what they want you to think is the reason it's happening is because anywhere we're bombing, they're in there. Again, it reminds me of Obama saying, if we bomb an area, well, they're combatants. Because if they're there, we label them combatants. So that four-year-old child literally gets labeled an armed combatant on their talking points. That's what actually happened. They proved that. And that's how war works. Lies. But the point is, there's been a lot of investigation. Robert points this out as well. That the And even some of the experts are telling you, these, the, the Hamas is in the tunnels underneath these buildings or in, just underneath Gaza in general. That's what, that's what they claim. That's what the experts will tell you. But then, and, then, and then even more so, the argument that they're using the tops of these roofs to fire these, the rockets again, that's been shown to be false. But it doesn't matter because the narrative flies because of emotion and people who want to act like you're terrorist because you don't agree with their side. The truth is, they're bombing innocent civilians because it seems, again, going back to the beginning, that there's an objective here to get these people out of the way, which, by the way, has been publicly stated more than once. And I'll give you those examples from today also in a minute. But it's saying the innocent, uh, the, the uh, Israeli military said in its statements to Palestinians, urging them to distance themselves from Hamas. Again, almost, see, that's almost like victim shaming right there, victim blaming. So then if they don't, then they died because they didn't get right away from Hamas. So it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's how this stuff tends to work. So that was yesterday. So here, again, was the one we talked about yesterday. I just wanted to read this one part again that I think is very important. The Red Crescent saying medics were refusing to leave, right? So these are people that are in the bombing zone right now. And will. I mean, pretty much all of Gaza has been shown to be the bombing zone. As even the New York Times just reported, right, that... They're going to the where they're telling them to go, and then they bomb those areas too. They go to the crossing to leave, and they bomb the crossing. That's two different locations that they've bombed innocent people after they told them to go there. On the record, even according to mainstream media, I've just it's both my mind. So my point is, there are now people that are staying there. Even as they're saying, get out of the way, we're going to do something crazy. You got Red Crescent and doctors and nurses. People are saying, we're going to stay with our patients. And the babies that can't leave the incubators, the people that are on respirators, and old people that can't get out of their beds, we're going to stay with them. So that means they're going to bomb and they're going to kill the people that stayed to protect their patients. The point was this one. As I already showed you yesterday, and I reported about this more than once, but this was in this episode and the one before it. Uh, maybe it's right here. No, it's not, the, not in the links right there, but the one I just talked about where I listed off the title saying they killed this many UN members, this many teachers, this many kids. The point is, even according to the Associated Press and the United Nations themselves, the agency, the UN, the UN specific agency for Palestinian refugees said that it would not evacuate its schools. That's, that's what they're saying. As of right, as the, when they're saying we're going to bomb, they said they would not. They're, and the number, as I remember, was 212,000, I think, over 200,000 people are in these schools because they're, they're not just because of the normal schools, but because they've gone there for shelter. So now you've got United Nations members, hundreds of thousands of children and injured people, women there to, for shelter. And they're saying we well, pretty much that they can't leave. So think about how disgusting that is, that they're telling you that they're going to bomb, which, by the way, they already are. And they've already killed 11 members of the U.N. team and 30 pupils of their schools, according to the mainstream media and the United Nations, that they're going to continue to do so. But they're going to possibly kill 212 plus thousand innocent people in these areas simply because they weren't able to leave. But, hey, they gave them 24 hours notice. Right, guys? Makes me sad. So let's bring this to more so today. Here is something that Dan Cohen shared. 
Israel Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, making it easy for international prosecutors to demonstrate his genocidal intent. Quote, Gaza won't return to what it was before. We will eliminate everything. As I said, as I told you, Netanyahu was lying about allowing them to, quote, return after they got displaced for the third, fifth, fourth, seventh, however many times these people have gotten displaced. Should they get forced to leave their homes again, which seems to be happening? Many of them because they just think that they know what these people are capable of and they want to get out of the way. But again, some of them are choosing not to. Before we go past that, let's, let's look at what he's saying here. Gaza won't return to what it was before. We will eliminate everything. It doesn't, it says it doesn't, if it doesn't take one day, it will take a week. <laughs> it will take weeks or even months. We will reach all places. There is no way that our brothers, our children, our parents will be killed. But it's okay if the parents, women, and children of their side get killed, right? Because that's what he's saying. And by the way, we'll get into these. Every one of these people has explicit statements on Twitter and elsewhere that, t that say these things, as I've played for you a hundred times over. They don't care about these people's lives. Now, yes, just to make it clear in the reverse, there's, probably, there's plenty of people that I can prove to you would feel the same way in reverse. Of course, it goes to mention that there's been 75 years of oppression, but that doesn't justify attacks on civilians. But the point is that what he's telling you is that this will never be the same, that they, these people are going, they're going to incur, every corner will be taken, and that they're only doing this because they're claiming they don't want their people to be killed. Now, in, in, in one side of that, you understand the idea of protecting your people. But the idea of going after and doing so at the expense of an entire civilian population is, is the very thing they pretend they're fighting against. He says, and, and we won't re react because we are a state. I'm not even sure what he means by that. Our parents, and he says, yeah. And we won't re react because we are a state. <laughs> So, you know, it's like, I guess that's supposed to compare it like the idea that that Palestine isn't. And somehow that, that's why they're reacting, even though I mean, it just doesn't hold any water. These people are the most reactive people. But he says, so we understand that Hamas wanted, I mean, the Zionist organization, by the way, we understand that Hamas wanted to change the situation. It will change back 180 degrees. So, I mean, that's, that's a basically a very, not very veiled way of saying we're going to return on them what they did to us. And they will regret this moment. They will regret it. Yeah. Well, Hamas or Palestine? Yeah, that's the that's the whole point. And as he's making very clear, you can't do that, as Dan Cohen is making clear, without direct without harming civilians. Or at the very least, without doing taking action like this without consideration for the civilian population that is present. It's basically the it's the same crime. You just don't get to close your eyes and stomp your feet and act like I didn't know they were there. Doesn't matter. And as Mark John points out, can you imagine a Russian representative saying that? Like, just think about how ridiculously hypocritical all this is. The double standards everywhere. If Putin stood up and literally said, we're going to go into Ukraine because they killed our people and we're going to take them out from corner to corner. Can you even imagine what would we, we'd be hearing for the next year? It's, I mean, it, it just, it, just because you have a different personal opinion on what these people are does not change the fact that the actions are the same and under international law, that's the whole point. Like that clip we played for you in the very beginning. All the Palestinian representatives are asking for is equal application of international law. End of story. Not happening. Now, here are some residents in Gaza still, and I'm seeing a lot of this, where they're saying Gaza residents organized dozens of these protests, and they're just refusing to evacuate. They're chanting, we prefer to die and not to be humiliated. Not in some kind of act of violence. They're just standing present. They're standing, this is a this is a nonviolent protest. They're, they're choosing to stay in their territory. That's the point I was making the other day. Just because they want to make it out to be anybody present is therefore supporting terrorism. It's a clumsy and illogical and insulting argument. These people have just endured decades of oppression. And they're now being forced to leave again. And the world's acting like it's in their benefit. I mean, that it's a crime, guys. That's another in a long series of war crimes. And even on top of it all, to add insult to injury, they're saying, oh, they're doing it for you. Talk about a, a convert, a, a, you know, contorting the reality to suit what you want to accomplish. 
Everybody who understands the history is going, my God, you're just blatantly framing another Nakba or displacement as some kind of protection. It's insulting. And, and in, on top of that, as they're currently still bombing Gaza and bombing anybody who tries to leave. You just can't ignore these things. Now, Francesca Al Albanese, UN Special Rapporteur, says, and I, I actually have a clip of her some, uh, later on the show. First of all, this is uh, this, this post saying Israel claims that these roads will be safe for 1.1 million people. This, I mean, look at how far that is, by the way. This is what they're talking about, walking that. Palestinians to vacate the north of Gaza between, uh, and this was posted today. What they're saying is between these hours, and I, as I understand, I don't think it's actually happened. I believe we're past that right now because it's on the other side of the world. No assurances for their safety in areas that they're forced to. No essential humanitarian relief allowed to meet their needs. No guarantee of return. I mean, guys, that's egregious. That's, that is not only, that's an insult, but it's a war crime. I and mean, what you're doing is forced displacement and you're not even trying to meet their needs. You know why? I think we know why. These people are, they're, they're hurting these people. Again, if you can't recognize that they're bombing them as they leave, do you think they care if they're fed? It says, at this tragic hour, and this again, the UN Special Rapporteur. And it says, striving to end apartheid. In this tragic hour, Palestinians in Gaza are forced to seek refuge in mass, possibly entering a new page of their forced exile, which is what I'm talking about. It's not for their protection. I call upon the UN, its member states, all people of conscience, which seems to be a dwindling number in my opinion right now, to push for an intermediate into immediate ceasefire. History will judge us if we fail to act immediately. I hope everybody out there listening who maybe agrees but's too afraid to say anything, recognize that. Your silence is tacit acceptance if you do not say something about what's going on. I'm not saying you have to get up and take violent action. What I'm saying is point out a crime when you see it. Stop pretending like these people that are out there acting like one side is there's only one sided story here, like KJP stupidly said. Call them out for it. There are civilians on every side of the, in any conflict, and it matters. And now what we're watching is the mass genocide of one side of that because of violent attacks on some on the other side. And it's, it's just despicable. Now let's read another an article from today. This is from the 14th. Palestinians in Gaza struggle to follow Israeli evacuation order and face dire water shortage. It says 1 million people have been displaced in total in one week. That's as of today. 1 million people have been displaced. I mean, that alone is unreal, guys. Now, again, let's not let's not forget how in six months everyone's going to pretend like all these refugees are somehow invading people's countries. Like, this is disgusting. And this is what always tends to happen. The only difference is right now we are forced to see, some of us anyway, what's building this. But realize in these other examples of like Venezuela or rather just South America or in, in Europe in general, we don't always see the illegal U.S. actions and others that are bombing and causing the refugees. Or we just ignore what's going on in Syria and act like that's not causing. The point is, this is typically how this works. These people don't want to leave, and, they, and then they get treated like they're somehow, a, and well, they are ultimately a burden, but it's not their fault. It's, it makes me sad. And then, and look, you can't ignore the fact that people might use that migration to carry out attacks or to manipulate people or use politics. to you know that, That's all part of it, and that's, that makes me even more sick that people use suffering people for their ends and act like they're there to help. Overall, 1 million people, which makes me sad. An estimated 35,000 displaced civilians have crammed into the grounds of Gaza City's main hospital, which, by the way, seems like where a lot of people are going to die if Gaza goes through or Israel goes through to what it's going to do. Sitting under trees in the empty grounds, as well as inside buildings, lobbies, and corridors, hoping they will be protected from the fighting, according to medical officials who have chosen to stay behind. Quote, people think this is the only safe place after their homes were destroyed. Not Hamas innocent civilians, and they were forced to flee, according to the health ministry. Gaza City is a frightening scene of devastation. Man, anybody ignoring this right now is one is just I, is unparalleled. Like, you are the worst person alive. If you can't acknowledge what's happening to them, I don't even know how you... Water has stopped coming out of taps across the territory. I'll, I'll let it read. There's, I was going to jump ahead, but I'll read the, the second. I'll let it keep going. The point is the water is contaminated. The water stopped coming out of taps across the territory. Amul Abu Yai Yai is a 25-year-old pregnant mother in the Jablaya refugee camp. Jablaya refugee camp. So you got a pregnant 
25 year old refugee. So that's just one person, right? Not Hamas. That 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 the the fetus inside of her is not Hamas, right? These people are suffering. She's struggling. She doesn't have where to go. She has no food, no water. She says she waits anxiously a few minutes every day or every other day even when, guess what? The contaminated water trickles from the pipes in her basement. That is unreal. This pregnant woman from a refugee camp has to wait possibly every other day from her own basement for contaminated water to trickle out and they drink that because that's all they got. She then rations that contaminated water, prioritizing it for her five-year-old son and her three-year-old daughter. She said she's drinking so little herself, she only urinates every other day. But it's all good because we're fighting Hamas, though, right, guys? Near the coast, the only tap water is contaminated with Mediterranean seawater because of the lack of sanitation facilities. Not by their own choice, guys, because the aid that gets sent never reaches it to them pennies get the point is we've proven over the years even human rights groups have talked about this that the aid that gets sent gets used by the it gets goes to the palestinian authority it goes through israel and a lot of it doesn't even make it to them and then on top of that they're not allowed to do whatever they want they can't just build all the things they need because it gets attacked or it gets removed or they won't let them they're not in their own little city this is an occupied territory an open-air prison if you don't understand that then you're not paying attention near the coast the only tap water is contaminated with seawater Mohammed Ibram, 28, said his neighbors in the Gaza city have just taken to drinking salt water because they have nothing else, which means they're going to die even faster. The Israeli military's evacuation would force the territory's entire population to cram into the southern half of Gaza as Israel continues to strike across the territory, including in the south. Right, including in the areas they tell them to go to. That's what that means. Ram Swalim said he and at least five families in his building decided to stay put in his apartment near Gaza City. It says, quote, we are rooted in our lands. We prefer to die in dignity and face our destiny. Of course, when they die, they'll pretend that that was Hamas. And that's how that works. But this is people that are done running, done being displaced. We're going to stay in our land and die with dignity. The UN Refugee Agency for Palestinians expressed concern for those who could not leave which now every other narrative aside, guys, every other narrative aside, pretending Hamas is everywhere, whatever you want to tell yourself, how do you rationalize this? Which, which we've already shown you, people being killed, pregnant, children, women, people in hospital, UN members. The UN is telling you that they, the people that aren't even allowed to leave, so they're going to get stuck there and they're going to die in this massive thing that's about to happen. Particularly pregnant women, children, older persons, persons with disabilities, saying that they must be protected. The agency also called for Israel to not target civilians because that's happening, guys. As much as people scream foul and don't want to say it's happening, we can prove it's happening. I just did. Targeting hospitals, schools, clinics, UN locations. All of that's been struck already. And realize, if you just want one provable example in this moment, the UN location did not house Hamas. That's the UN who's already spoken about this. That, As I said, 11 plus people of their own staff have been killed. 30 children in their school have been killed teachers, engineers. So if you if you could understand that that happened, stop pretending like all these locations are Hamas. Al-Shifa Hospital was receiving hundreds of wounded every hour and had used up 95% of its medical supplies. Those are all civilians. Hospital Director Mohammed Abu Salim said this, water is scarce and the fuel powering its generators is dwindling. Quote, the situation inside the hospital is miserable in every sense of the word, he said. The operating rooms don't stop. An Israeli military spokesman, Jonathan uh, uh, Conris Conricus, said the evacuation was aimed at keeping civilians safe and preventing Hamas from using them as human shields. You know, you're doing it for them, right? You're, you're bombing children's hospitals and UN members for them. Of course you are. He urged people in the targeted areas to leave immediately and to return only when we tell them to, except the other guys going, you're never coming back because we're going to blow it all up and it's never going to be the same. But we'll tell you when you can come back. Go ahead and leave. And we'll bomb you on the way. But go ahead and leave. And then we'll bomb the crossing. But go ahead and leave. Oh, and that's right, that they're not even letting aid and not letting them cross. The idea that they will let it bomb for seven days and then tell them to leave. If you believe that, I've got a bridge to sell you. The Palestinian civilians in Gaza are not our enemies, Israel now says, after seven days of indiscriminate bombing. We don't assess them as much as such, and we don't target them as such. 
We're trying to do the right thing. Again, just their bombing over the week does not, is obviously that's not true. But how about the, their own statements? Repeatedly, they're animals. They shouldn't exist. They're not people. Over and over and over. But I guess that just doesn't matter, right? Because that, they, that these are taken out of context or it's not the right information. They're saying this because the world's beginning to pay attention. They're going, you're murdering people. And so now they're just, oh, well, hey, we'll, we'll, do, we'll, we'll get him out of the way. 24 hours. You don't just do that after seven days of indiscriminate bombing. Quote, I came here with my children. We slept on the ground. We don't have a mattress or clothes, says 63-year-old who was from northern town of Beit Hanun. I want to go back to my home, even if it's destroyed. Which I, I can almost guarantee you, if these people leave, they will not come back. The Gaza Health Ministry said Saturday that over 2,200 people have been killed in the territory, including 724 children, 458 women. Now, I realize that. And this is being reported roundly from no more, multiple uh, uh, agencies, organizations. 724 children. 458 women. So realize that that is alone. Those are civilians, clearly. We're not even including men civilians who aren't Hamas, which is uh, untold. But we're still, I mean, think about how much has been bombed in this area. The rubble of mul just whole multiple blocks upon blocks upon neighborhoods, ground, floored, leveled. There's people under there that we don't know about. But then it goes on to say, well, and then as Ham the, the Hamas communications office said that Israel's completely demolished over 7,000 housing units, which, by the way, is being backed up by, I, I think, the UN. I'll get to it in a second. More than 1,300 people on the Israeli side, they say. Roughly 1,500 Hamas militants died during the fighting. Okay, so if we, they're saying 1,300 people died in Israel. That means, and I can promise you, that the reason we're not being told is because I believe most of them are, are IDF members. Whether they were acting at that or not, or not, the point is the IDF members are predominantly what I think was being killed. That's my opinion. We'll see what happens. I, I kind of feel like we're never really going to get the information, largely because I think there might be more that we're being lied to about, but we'll get there in a second. But then compare that. Not with, and then again, 1,500 Hamas militants. Okay, so that's, that's its own thing. So 1,500 Hamas while they were doing this. And they claim 1,300 people died in Israel while that happened. Much of, many of them, some of them were, Hamas, were IDF. So 724 children and 458 women are independent of that. So realize that number. Guys, I mean, that's that right now that we're looking at almost the same amount of people killed just in women and children in Gaza than what they claim the entire Israeli side has suffered, many of which were IDF. How do we not recognize that as a, as a human race? Egyptian officials said the country's Rafa boarding crossing with Gaza would be open Saturday for the first time in days to allow foreigners out. So that's today. We're hearing that they're saying that it will be open. I, you guys tell me what you're seeing because I'm going to follow up on that. But, oh no, this, that, that's the point actually. I, I remember thinking that when I, when I highlighted it. But it says by Saturday evening, there had been no movement. So same point. I guess as of right now, nobody has tried. And I, you know why? Because I think they know they're going to be bombed. Because I know they, they bombed the crossing and they bombed anybody trying to cross. That's already happened twice. So interestingly enough, people are going, no, we're not going to. Either way, the point is, people are there and they're going to continue to bomb. There were, it says there were believed to be some 1,500 people in Gaza holding Western passports. 1,500 people holding Western passports. You realize that makes them U.S. citizens, guys. Well, actually, I think, I mean, I'm pretty sure if you have a passport, you have to be a citizen, right? And I think because if you have, I believe so. Let me know in the chat. I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking of this any kind of like a weird in middle ground in that, like maybe refugee. I don't know. But bottom line is we do know that according to the U.N. embassy that there's 400 or 600 U.S. citizens in Gaza. Now they're telling you there's some 1,500 people with Western passports. Oh, excuse me, Western, not just the United States. But it says and additional people with passports from other parts of the world. So there's people, there's citizens in Gaza from all around the world, and they're bombing indiscriminately. Crazy. Egyptian authorities erected temporary blast walls on Egypt's side of the crossing which has been closed for days because of Israel's airstrikes. Again, every ally in the world is acknowledging that Israel bombed its own crossing. That's a war crime. Two Egyptian officials said on condition of anonymity because they were not authorized to brief the media. Everyone knows, but everyone's lying. 
in regard to the governments. The U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, of course, met with Saudi foreign minister, which I'll show you in a second, uh, Fasil bin Farhan in Riyadh on Saturday. And both called for Israel to protect civilians in Gaza. Understand how ridiculous that is. Blinken nodding along as he says this, even though they literally just said, Israel, do whatever you need to. We support you. That's not protecting civilians. That's continuing to indiscriminately bomb, acting like you're doing this in their interest. That's just ridiculous. As Israel pursues its legitimate right to defend its people and to try and, and to trying. That's weird. It's the. That's Blinken. This is his quote. As Israel pursues its legitimate right to defend its people and to trying to ensure that this never happens again, it is vitally important that all of us look out for civilians. That is such a half-hearted false statement. If all you do is start with Israel's right to defend itself, so we need to look out for civilians. That doesn't mean anything. As they pursue their religion, those things are different conversations. You don't get to pretend that because they defend themselves, therefore that might cause casualty. If you kill civilians, that's a crime. But as long as they bunch them together, when anybody talks about civilians, they go, what about their defense? What about the other people that get killed? Well, what about it? Those things matter. We can talk about those. But what about the civilians being killed? That's just a, a childish, cowardly redirection of the information. Everybody in the world has a right to defend themselves. Interestingly, I did find one group that the world doesn't think they can defend themselves, and I'll show you that in a minute. But Blinken doesn't believe that. It's clear by their actions. And especially when you start with, as they pursue their legitimate right to defend themselves, we'll look out for the civilians. How do you even pretend those sentences even go together? Hamas said Israel's airstrikes killed 22 hostages. So now they're telling you it's 22 people that have been killed, including foreigners, which I believe are probably you know multiple. The, the idea is I believe that there was a huge number of the U.S. civilians, but then now they're saying 1,500 of Western passports. So that would mean potentially even majority of them are not American. But in any case... Plenty of other foreign nations they're claiming, and I don't know why nobody else cares about that. But it says it didn't provide their nationalities, and Israel military denied it, of course. Of course they would, especially if it happened. In the occupied West Bank, the Palestinian Health Ministry says 53 Palestinians have been killed since the start of the war. So that's one, one more day forward. Now we're up to 53 in the West Bank, including 16 just yesterday. The UN says attacks by Israeli settlers have surged. There's your point. Even the Associated Press can acknowledge that you're what we're and steering girls been covering it. There are roaming groups of settlers with machine guns that are just killing Palestinians. And even the corporate media can talk about it. And the United Nations says attacks by settlers have surged on civilians. Why doesn't that matter? As we're all folk po pointing in one certain direction, you've got other allegedly civilians, but again, my opinion, they're count as occupying forces, armed occupying forces, but that's a conversation to be had. But you're telling me they're walking around with guns and killing Palestinians at, at up to 53 now in the West Bank. But no, no big deal. We won't even talk about it. The U.S. and Israel's other allies have pledged ironclad support for the war. Exactly. So here's a Blinken up here nodding like, a, like an idiot. Yeah, we care for civilians, but then goes and says, do what you need, whatever you need, we support you. Makes me sick. So here is ex-Israeli deputy foreign minister, and this is a really important point that was just made. They claim they care about these people, right? Isn't that the whole argument? That they're saying we want to get the civilians out of the way, right? Because we want to we want to make sure civilians don't get hurt. And in saying so, they're very clearly drawing a line between Hamas and civilians. I know they don't mean that. The point is that they're doing that to make it seem so you think that they're trying to get them out of the way. But even in that narrative, it exposes one very important thing. Told everyone to leave the area. Where were they to go? Okay. Very, very, I mean, this was, this is thought out. It's not something that we tell them, go, uh, go to the beaches, go drown yourselves, uh, God forbid. Not at all. There is a huge expense almost endless space in the Sinai Desert, just on the other side of Gaza. The idea is, and this is not the first time it will be done, the idea is for them to live over to the open areas where we and the international community will uh, prepare the infrastructure, you know, tent cities with food and with water. You know what, just like for the refugees of Syria that fled the butchering of uh, Assad a few years ago, to Turkey, which was not even what was happening, by the way. But, you know, just ha happy to conflate other propaganda narratives. 
Right. Assad was being framed for attacks by the U.S. government, as even the U.N. has confirmed what they lie about today. Turkey received two million of them. This is the idea. Again, I say there is a way to receive them all on the other side for temporary time on, on Sinai. Because what did Hamas turn out? On the other Gaza? side, are we Gaza talking about Rafah? Are, are you saying they, the other side that go to Egypt? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And Egypt will have to play ball because this is human life is at stake. Well, we want to open a humanitarian corridor so they can leave. But if Hamas... Right. So they can get the hell out of there because isn't that what they ultimately want? So you could even make an abstract argument that a lot of this being so over the top was meant to make you think, oh, okay, as long as they stop murdering them all, then we'll accept, even though it's also a war crime, mass displacement yet again. Because let's get them out of the way. That's an interesting thing to think about. Especially since we just showed you in the beginning, in March, they were already talking about how this was, they we're going to take Gaza back. So now, this seems to be leading in that direction. And now even taking, we know the whole problem, reaction, solution mindset, right? So you act in such an over-the-top way, so people go, whoa! And then you give them the argument you actually wanted was, let's move them into Egypt. And everyone goes, okay, that's better than killing them all. Something interesting to think about. So that who can leave? Hamas so that who can leave? Citizens? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And in Sorry, I just I just rolled it back a second. That seemed like it was fluid. I rolled it back a second because I want you to hear this in 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 success in, uh, continually. This what he says here is important. Egypt will have to play ball because this is human life is at stake. Well, we want to open a humanitarian corridor so they can leave. But if Hamas So that who can Hamas leave? So that who can leave? Citizens? <laughs> You're saying civilians can leave? But only through the Rafah border, correct? At this point, yes. So they can't because come. Where else? Your country. <laughs> they can come into Israel. I'm telling you one more thing. I want to say. Uh, no, no, but, but uh, I want say, you to. Uh, I want you to address that point. Don't just smile, sir. Respectfully, you're saying they. they you're, not, you're making a corridor. I'm, they can go to. They can go to Egypt. You're bombing them. You say you want to save them, but you, they can't come in. I, first of all, I'm not smiling. I'm crying in my heart. I'm. Right. That's an excellent point, if you understand what he's getting at. And then, of course, I want to show you this. This guy just says, I'm not smiling. Yeah, hardly. <laughs> then he simply just says, the man cannot even be honest about his own face. The point is, you pretend you care about these civilians, right? We care about them. We want to get them out of the way. And again, the point was, by doing so, you're clearly sh you're saying they're not Hamas. So these people are not our enemy, even though that's not true, in my mind, and by their own statements. But so you're doing saying, OK, but the, but he goes, but they can only go to Egypt. So if these are innocent people who you are so pretending that you're trying to help, why wouldn't you let them into Israel? You see, because people online are going, that's the whole problem, because they're conflating Hamas with Palestine or really admitting the truth, which is that they only just don't like Palestine or Palestinians and they want to get them out of the way. But it opens up a very interesting contradiction. If you're trying to protect them. There's an easy answer to this, especially even since there's an uh, West Bank. It, 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 it's going to be impossible. And the point would be that this shouldn't be happening to begin with. And I'm not saying they should move out of the place that they're currently in. What I'm saying is this a narrative exposes the fact that they don't care about them, that they're pretending to to get them the hell out of the way. And there's a very simple solution should they need to move them is the idea that they could let them into Israel to make sure that they're safe while they deal with Hamas. See my point? None of that makes sense to me. But the point is, the fact that they can't state that or they refuse to let that be a possibility exposes what they're really doing. I thought that was a very well done point. Now, David DeCant points out, again, as we've already shown you, and now this is round, as even he just briefly pointed out, this has been a court, this has been acknowledged by mainstream media and pretty much everybody else. As I just read to you in the New York Times, I believe, Israel orders them to evacuate and bombs them as they flee. This is the Middle East eye, but again, everybody around the world seems to have acknowledged this, including bombing their own crossing first, then bombing them as they leave. 40 killed in an Israeli airstrike targeting a truck that was evacuating people from Gaza as they told them to take that route. Now here is Eye on Palestine. There's, there's some graphic stuff in here, okay, so be prepared for that. Israeli occupation forces deceived the citizens of Gaza after warning them to leave their homes and then attack them while they were leaving. This one, just a guy's very upset. The other one's the one I wanted to show, actually. But yeah, these are right. They're rightly horrified. People died, likely some of their family members. Here's the ones that survived.
all civilians. Also, just take note of how many people are still there refusing to leave. I mean, it's going to be horrific, guys, if they really do take some kind of serious, more so than they're already doing action, which again, it's almost dumb even to say that because carpet bombing the entire area for seven days is pretty ridiculous. I mean, I don't know how it could get any worse, quite frankly, unless they just do some kind of chemical, biological, or nuclear weapon. I mean, quite frankly, I mean, this is over the top. That's why people, even the corporate media, I mean, it's it's this, it's gone. I mean, they lost control of this because of how disgusting their actions were. Vanessa Bealy, even this again, this one, is, I, I think I'm even going to skip some parts on this. It's pretty rough. It's being reported that Israel demanded the civilians leave and then bombed them as they were leaving the same point. And we showed you the video yesterday of one of these trucks that had people in it that were just, you know, some of them dead, some of them bleeding. And somebody even used an image already to compare, to compare. That's, I don't want to get it too graphic, guys. It's, it's, it gets, it's disgusting. There's obviously dead people everywhere. And we just showed you, uh, there was a, a, an image somebody put out comparing the original uh, displacement in 48, showing them loading Palestine into the back of the trucks and leaving the area. Same thing's happening now. Different narrative, of course. That's how that tends to work. Here are some still images from Times of Gaza. More than 8,000 Palestinians have been injured, most of them children. I mean, and there's just no way to miss what's going on. This is due to Israeli bombing. Here's the cradle. Reporting the same number. 724 children killed, 485 women independent of the 1,500 Hamas members they claim were killed. Almost the same amount in just civilians compared to what they claim was killed in Israel. And of course, this guy responds by saying, these numbers are from the VAERS database. Interestingly enough, showing his ignorance twice in a row. <laughs> I find that ridiculous. As the VAERS database being very, very important, whether it's provable or not, this guy doesn't understand that, thinks he's pretending this means it's fake. The guy is just showing how stupid he is in two different ways. David, and, th and this is a really hard, this one actually kind of struck me for some reason. I mean, obvious reasons, but all of this is horrible. This one just kind of made me extra sad. Dan Kovelik, who is a lawyer, professor, and author of several books, says, I just learned that my friend in Gaza, Heba Zagot, a great artist, was killed by Israel. Her last words to me in a text were, quote, we are sitting with the children. There is bombing. I feel afraid. Her words were accompanied by these photos. And reports today are that she has been killed. And this is roundly being reported. And I, th this has been confirmed by a few people. But again, you know, sometimes like like with the the girl from uh, like the news we reported on. You know, this, that, this take things with a grain of salt today because people are saying a lot of stuff. But from what I can tell, and I did look into this, this woman has been killed. Heba Zaugot, one of Palestine's most promising fine artists, has been killed this morning along with her son and several family members in an Israeli airstrike. And then, of course, this disgusting human being, which seems to be some kind of bot, says, who started first? Right, because we're talking about Hamas and Israel, right? Or are we talking about an average Palestinian woman that got bombed with an illegal airstrike, and somehow that's her fault because Hamas did something, right? No, that's called collective punishment, and that you're a disgusting person. Times of Gaza points out that about 90% of the Israeli bombing targets were residential areas that are densely populated, which, by the way, is simply Gaza million children, half of the population, most densely civilian, one of the most densely civilian populated areas on the planet. Just destroyed. IR, the, uh, the Red Cross points out thousands of buildings have been destroyed. Mass casualties are unlike anything seen in past years. And by the way, they're just talking about Gaza. The medical system is on its knees. As Gaza loses power, hospitals lose power, water cannot be pumped, sewage systems will flood. 
So now you're going to now, now on top, just like with Yemen, you're going to now begin to see illness rise up as well, which will then probably be used against them just like everything else. Thousands of buildings have been destroyed. Mass casualties are unlike anything seen in past years. The medical system is on its knees. As Gaza loses power, hospitals lose power. Water cannot be pumped. Sewage systems will likely flood. People have nowhere else to go. Sad. The Cradle reports the Gaza Ministry of Information says that 1,000, 1,695 buildings have been completely destroyed. I mean, just look at that image, guys. Look into the distance. Does that look like targeted aiming at Hamas, or does that look like an entire residential block leveled? 1,695 buildings. As Eva Bartlett writes, stating the obvious... But if any, quote, enemy government, which NATO wanted to destroy or overthrow, were to do the same as Zionist Israel, lock 2.3 million people in an open air prison, carpet bomb entire neighborhoods, dropping 6,000 bombs weighing 4,000 tons, fire shells with white phosphorus on trapped populations, how mutilated, though, uh, just see how mutilated those who managed to survive, and it's, it's verifiable that it happened, again, even according to human rights groups, white phosphorus are, kill medics who were trying to rescue injured civilians, and again, it says, including medics who were given permission to enter and then bomb them, that's the Red Crescent, verifiable, bomb hospitals, premeditate to bomb hospitals, tell the population it needs to leave via one tiny crossing to a negotiate to a neighboring country, then bomb that crossing repeatedly, making them impossible, leaving impossible, cut off entry of water, electricity, and food, tell the half of the population they need to move from the north to the south of their prison, and then bomb that area too. Massacre civilians as they try to leave, cut the internet so journalists can't report and civilians can't get on social media to share their experiences being genocided. There would be outrage. If any one of those individual things was carried out by, let's say, Iran, we would never hear the end of it. But because it's Israel, the virtue signaling and hashtagging of Western prostitutes and politicians is even stronger and more revolting than it was for Nazis in Ukraine or Al-Qaeda in Syria. Makes me sick. They're saying now that 2,215 people have been killed, over almost 9,000 wounded. Now, here's the part I was referencing before. Thank you to Simon from Florida for talk, for pointing this out. This is a post with Blinken meeting the representative of Saudi Arabia. Now, I'm in no way arguing that Saudi Arabia has any moral high ground. Clearly, in my opinion, I think this is either, I mean, who knows if there's younger generations trying to do something different. I mean, I'm not, in no way, Saudi Arabia is, is a, an authoritarian state, period. And it's a horrible, bottom line is, I don't know whether he may think this and it's just different than whatever else thinks or whether he's just saying it because it's the politically advantageous thing to say right now, which I believe because everybody's beginning to recognize this. Here he is saying to Blinken that we need to care about civilians and Blinken like a complete idiot nods along as he's allowing civilians to die. <laughs> the beginning is really hard to hear. It's the part like halfway through that matters, but it basically just kind of starts up kind of saying roundabout the, things. Uh, primary suffer of this situation are civilians. Civilian civilians on both sides are being affected and uh, condemn the targeting of civilians in any form, any time uh, by anyone. So you condemn the targeting of civilians from any form, any time from anyone, he nods along while he's giving them all the support they need to do exactly that. And uh, I think that's something that's very clear, that's something that's clearly adopted by the Arab League. That said, the priority now needs to, to be to stop further civilian suffering. And yeah, we need to find a way to quickly de-escalate the situation, to quickly bring uh, back uh, peace, uh, at least uh, stopping the guns, and then uh, working towards addressing also the humanitarian challenges. And here yeah, I have to emphasize that the humanitarian situation in Gaza is very, very difficult, and we need to work together to make sure that access for humanitarian uh, uh, relief and good. And there he just nodded again, like a complete fool. Oh, you mean the aid Blinken that you know they're not letting in as you nod along and agree that's supposed to be happening? So either you are nodding and you don't think that, or you're nodding and acknowledging what Israel's doing is a crime. Well, it's both those things, in fact, because whether he nods or not, it's a crime that Israel's committing. My point is, he nods along in front of everybody while they know they're not allowing it to happen. Just recognize how despicable these people are.
this is allowed. Uh, uh, this is something that is critical and is, of course, enshrined in international humanitarian law. And we need to work together to find a way out of the cycle of violence. And this is something that we really, really need to focus on without uh, a concerted effort to end uh, this constant return to violence. It will always be the civilians that suffer first. It will right. always be civilians on both sides that end up paying the price. So I hope that... Oh, so I guess he's a terrorist then. Well, you know, you can make arguments. But my point is that by simply saying that... that there are civilians on both sides that matter in the United States. Apparently, you're the worst person alive if you say that right now, which is pretty contradictory. We can you know, find a way uh, to de-escalate the current situation and then hopefully move forward to a more permanent solution. So thank you again for coming to me. Again. Yeah, yeah, not a long, Blinken, because you clearly don't agree with that, right? Yeah, we should find a way to, to de-escalate the situation. Oops. <laughs> Let's not forget, 30 seconds ago, they said, don't even, buddy, even talk about de-escalation. That's the same, same point, but from a different link. Right, Huffington Post, the State Department says, I don't want you diplomats even mentioning the word de-escalation. Do not call for a, for a ceasefire. That's what the U.S. government is telling their diplomats. And Blinken's going, uh-huh, yeah, de-escalation, uh, we agree. Because he's a clown, guys. These people are ridiculous. Now, this, uh, the, uh, what, it's uh, Bin Faran or Farsal, the, the minister. People are asking in the chat. So if you don't want to ceasefire, you don't want to de-escalate, don't pretend like you're nodding along with the idea that civilians matter and that we should de-escalate to make sure they're safe, because literally the opposite is happening. But let's get into the actual evidence of how they don't actually care about who is a civilian and who isn't. Because in their minds, all of these people in Gaza, as you hear from some of the more frothing at the mouth, maniacal, like psychopath level people that support them. I don't know, like Laura Loomer, who will openly say none of them are anything other than terrorists and every single one of them should be killed, which she literally tweeted out right when this started. They, that's what they think. And that's despite the fact that people in their government will tell the Western world that we're trying to get them out of the way because we care about the civilians. Guys, this is the president of Israel. Listen to what he says. We are working, operating militarily according to rules of the international law, period. Unequivocally. It's an entire nation. I mean, that's wildly false. Just because you say unequivocally does not mean that's true. Every group that has a standing to discuss international law is saying you're violating international law. They're, it's meanwhile, and simultaneously, they're saying, and we also condemn Hamas's actions. But that does not mean that you did not violate international law and you do not continue to just by your existence understand, which is going to bother people that I said that, but it's the simple truth. The illegal occupation is a violation of international law, period. The point, though, is he's saying today we're doing so, even though you can point out from the beginning they can't be if they're occupation. But at the same time, the U.N., human rights groups around the world. Even other governments are speaking up and saying you're violating. That's, I mean, not a, we don't even need that. It's the most simplistic definition of collective punishment that's taking place right in front of our eyes. That's my point, though. He just stands up and says, unequivocally, international law. And that's what Blinken goes, uh-huh. Or Matt at the State Department goes, we, we asked them, so they should be. We'll follow up next year, maybe, or not. They don't care, is the point. Out there, unequivocally. It's an international law, period. Unequivocally. It's an entire nation out there that is responsible. It's not true. This record. Oh, so now it's a nation. I thought it didn't exist, though. So is it a nation that existed and you're occupying? Or is it a nation now that's literally within Israel? How does that make sense? Pick a side. Oops. Right. They, you know, it makes sense now to try to frame them as some kind of independent thing because now they can dr deal with them that way. The point, though, is that they are either a nation you're occupying, which they deny, which is true, though, or it's somehow a nation that exists in the middle of Israel. Explain that for me. I mean, he just trapped himself with his own words. They don't care. These Zionist, men, these people are out. And this is why I often point out the Orthodox Jews of the world who are exposing what these people really are. Most of them, I, I would argue, don't really care about the ultimate objectives of Judaism. They care about using that to achieve their goals. And that's based on the history. That's based on other Orthodox Jews that call them out in Israel, in New York, in London, all around the world. And then, like this, when they just contradict their own statements and e expose the fact they lie as a matter of policy. But now he's going to go on to blame the entire state of Palestine because they didn't do anything to fight the group that you guys created 
and fund. And Israel is now blaming Netanyahu for doing that today. And yet then you argue they were somehow responsible. They should have been what? Waging a war against the people inside Palestine with limited resources, 97% undrinkable water, not enough electricity that you turn off at your whim with what naval force, with what? Like, think about how ridiculous that is. But it's their fault now. So even by, but on top of all of it, though, even if you argue that was some kind of legitimate, argu legitimate argument, you don't get to say because they didn't do anything, we're now going to bomb them like anybody else. Again, it's blatant collective punishment. Like, I mean, the most clear example I think I've ever seen. But here he is about to say that they're all allowed to be bombed. Rhetoric about civilians not, where, where not aware, not involved. It's absolutely not true. They could have risen up, they could have fought against that evil regime which took over Gaza in a coup d'etat. Right, I mean, think about the idea of any other example where the U.S. government has carried out a regime change, and then any time anybody pushes back against that, you call them terrorists. Funny how it's inverted whenever you want it to be, right? But we're at war. We are at war. We're at war with, at our, we are defending our homes. We're protecting our homes. That's the truth. And then when a nation protects its home, it fights. And we will fight until we'll break their backbone. Okay, so how, so is it okay for them to fight? To defend their home? Didn't you just say there was a nation that you were dealing with? Oops. Already done with your sentence. You're not even done with your sentence. And now you're, the point is, if they're a nation, what you said to begin with, then they have a right to defend themselves. Right? And if they're being attacked and they can defend, they, I mean, it's the same argument. But it's weird how their arguments applied just to the other side of the game, I shouldn't call it a game, but the other side of the dynamic suddenly is insulting. It's just as simple. It's, it's the most blatant, hypocrite. The point is that in history, most people are afraid to push back with stuff like this because they get called racist. The time is changing because we're not racist. We're pointing out that the people that are conducting these actions are both racist, maniacal, authoritarian. And I could go on forever. Expert says double. Oops. Sorry, that was the, the wrong one. Here we go. So Israel's president claims there are no innocents in Gaza Strip. That's what he's saying. Keep in mind, 44% of them, and in fact, I think it's more than that. I think it's over 50% are children. Oh, well, they say civilians. So the point is, though, there are 50% of the population are children. But somehow they're all... So, the, yeah, the baby born yesterday was supposed to rise up against Hamas. I mean, think about how inherently dishonest that argument is. What about all the elderly people? What about the people that are disabled? Are they supposed to rise up against Hamas? Do you blame them for not taking action against the group that you created? <laughs> I mean, it's, this is just wholesale. Like, this is rationalizing genocide. The Cradle points out the Israeli Minister of Energy, Israel Katz, says, we will not reduce the aerial bombardment on Gaza, and the Palestinian people bear responsibility. They, the civilians, bear responsibility for the, their action of cutting off water and electricity. That's called a collective punishment. You don't blame civilians for not doing something you wanted. I mean, th this, no other country could get away with this. And then Craig Murray points out a very, the perfect point. Those who continue to deny that Gaza is a prison camp need to explain why Israel is able to cut off its water, its power, its food, and internet, and has prevented it from operating a port or an airport, which it has. He says, I actually want explanations from you, because all these people that are screaming that they have all this aid, and they could have done all this stuff, and they're independent state, it's not true. They live inside of a prison, and they are controlled. They've tried to start things like this in the past, and they get destroyed, or they get bombed. And the point is, the aid barely even reaches it to these people. How can you pretend that they have all this access and they spend it only on bombs when they've got 97% undrinkable water that does not, that they're not in control of. It's very clear what's happening. People just don't want to acknowledge it. Now here is a member, a UN expert who is telling you without question, this is collective punishment, war crimes, illegal occupation. How politicians and media. This UN expert says double standards shape how politicians and media treat Israelis and Palestinians. I think that the Palestinian population are not treated as a people under occupation, and Israel is never held accountable. That was Francesca Albanese, the UN Special Rapporteur and expert on human rights in the occupied Palestinian territories. She explains how the violence in Israel and occupied Gaza is not happening in a vacuum. And while the Israeli government and Hamas have both been accused of war crimes, the reaction from the US and Europe nearly always blames Palestinians and defends Israel. The double standards are 
dramatically evident, both in the treatment of the Palestinians versus Israel, and uh, in the way also Israel is held uh, up to certain standards compared to other countries. Palestinians cannot be held responsible as a people for the heinous crimes that Hamas has conducted as of the 7th of October. And civilians should never be targeted, both uh, Israelis and Palestinians. So targeting civilians becomes uh, a war crime on both sides. And to be clear, we already have evidence, even now according to the corporate media, that they're actually targeting civilians, which we already knew. But whether or not they're aiming at an individual convoy of civilians or just disregarding that they're present, it applies to the same concept. That's what she's saying. They're quibbling with the word targeting. But now we can prove they are anyway directly targeting, which I already knew. But the idea that we know that there's 50% of the population are children, they know that too. As, I mean, I really, the one thing that really does blow my mind is that there are so many people I mean, I was going to say Israelis, but again, I, I don't think, I think a lot of it, most Israelis seem to be calling out their own government right now, but a lot of people around the world are taking the line that this is okay. Meanwhile, there's 600, 400, 600 U.S. citizens in Gaza. 50% of them are children. 50% of the people are children that are there. UN members are there. Hostages from Israel's side are there. And yet they're just bombing all over the place. Like, I don't even know how anybody makes sense of that. It just seems, I mean, obviously just irresponsible, dangerous at the very least along with being a massive war crime. And there's something else worth noting that some coverage is missing. Palestinians are under occupation, and Israel is the occupying force. There is no symmetry between the parties, between Supporting. the two people. One is the occupying power, who should also protect the Palestinian people, right. but it has relinquished de facto this, this responsibility long ago. Right, and this is something Jimmy Dore brought up on the interview. Right. I mean, as weird as it may sound to people, an occupying force, especially when it maintains the occupation, has legal obligation to take care of these people. Like just because you point at an element of it that's bad and you claim they're attacking you does not mean you just wholesale don't. That's the point. It's always been collective punishment. And I continue to argue that it's by design to make I mean, the, 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 it's being shown in clear display right now that they don't care about these people and they don't want them there. And now that's it's that's the point, though. The illegal occupation can end and then they don't need to take care of them, but that's not what they want. They want the territory. So it's just an ongoing continuation of displacement and trying to take this. It's land grabs, right? This is occupation. Gaza has been under blockade, which is a form of collective punishment and, right. uh, and a war crime since 2007. It's so understand that. This is not new. They, this has been ongoing since 2007. It's always been a war crime. Just like it's a war crime, do that to Yemen. But nobody cares. These people get away with whatever they want. Link to the, also the Commission of Crimes Against Humanity. Because intentional starvation of people is a crime against humanity. Israel's like, illegal like decades-long occupation of... Like Yemen, like Iran, like Syria, like Venezuela. That's what they do, guys. And I'm talking about the Western powers here. Palestinians has largely gone without any consequences at the expense of Palestinians' right to self-determination. The UN expert has identified at least four ways Israel systematically denies Palestinians that right. One, the continued splintering of a future Palestinian state. Israel has completely fragmented, separated, disentangled, made the territorial unity, the territorial contiguity of the occupied Palestinian territory, future Palestine, future independent Palestinian state, impossible to israel's exploitation Th that's the point i made i kind of made before about the idea that the west bank and, pa and gaza are are separated right so it make it, it make that's that's not by accident of land water and other natural resources in the occupied palestinian territories three palestinian disenfranchisement and israel's denial of a healthy palestinian political system and four the erasure of palestinian identity or de-palestinization think also of the repression of the palestinian flag think about the overlaps with ukraine and Russia and the idea of Ukraine removing people for say you're not allowed to speak Russian. We can't you're not allowed to have the Russian flag. It's the same damn thing, guys. And don't miss the overlap to what side who who's on what side in all this. And I don't mean Russia, US or anything like that. I mean just the idea of human rights, the law. And all the people that these Western powers continually back seem to carry out the same actions, seem to be the same kind of willfully ignorant people when it comes to the law, application of the law when it comes to their actions.
Now, that doesn't remove any accountability from groups like Russia or China or anybody else. I, I've made the same points are made in the same. But the only difference is the same thing we could make in regard to this small example now is that when you broaden this out, you can see the U.S. government in particular marching around and overthrowing countries and acting with many different acts of war crimes. And you don't see Russia doing that, at least not in the same way. Again, I don't think any government is a good guy, but you have to acknowledge that very clear dynamic difference. And the same thing is happening right in front of us now. We just have to be honest about it. This is a way to erase the culture. Well, Palestinians have been repressed, including in the West, for demonstrating their support uh, with the Palestinian people under occupation. So what's the solution to ending the cycle of violence between occupier and the occupied? You cannot leave an occupier um, determine the faith of the occupied people when the intentions are critically illegal. Again, taking on the land without the people. There's no question that it's Israel is practicing uh, apartheid, is imposing an apartheid regime uh, on the Palestinians. But I say the end result of abolishing apartheid is equality for all. Exactly. The exact opposite thing that they want. And it most definitely is apartheid. For those that may not know that, I'll just grab one of the many. This is Amnesty International. You could look up Human Rights Watch, but Selim, which is an Israeli human rights group, that all openly tell you it's apartheid, despite the fact that they'll tell you that's a lie, like many other very easily proven to true, true things, which should make you wonder how, why they're able to lie about so many things. So here is the Israeli Minister of Energy and Infrastructure, who is a member of the Political Security Cabinet and a member of the Knesset, who just publicly tweeted this. They, the Palestinian civilians, will not receive a drop of water or a single battery until they leave the world. Look at that. And yet we're told something different. Now, first of all, what's interesting is, and again, like I've said many times, I am no fan of any of these politicians. This is not me siding with AOC. The point is that I, I can tell that they recognize a political advantageous move here by taking this, the right side, as it were. right? This, the, the side of international law. But I don't believe it's because they truly think that. At least I don't know. I don't care. The point is these people have been shown to be manipulators in my mind. The bottom line is what she wrote was, oh, and this, first of all, this is a uh, editor of the Trump and uh, 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 pundit says, Israeli energy minister Dukat says no electrical switch will be turned on. No hydrant will be open. No fuel truck will enter until abductees are returned home. Okay, we've heard this argument a lot, right? Alex Berninson thinks he's making some moral stance by acting like we're waiting until the hostages are returned. Well, that's collective punishment. So just admit that you're okay being just as morally corrupt as the other side. If you, their whole, and on top of the fact that we know there are over 5,000 people held without charge in Israel that are Palestinians. And I'm going to make a point about that in a second. The point is, well, I mean, I'll, how about I just, I'll make it now since it's relevant and I'll make it again in a second. What if the, what if the Palestinians, or Hamas for that matter, were to say, okay, well, we're going to continue bombing indiscriminately all throughout Israel until you give us our hostages back? Isn't that the same exact thing? It is. What do you think Israel would say? You know what they would say. Is it, so the only difference is the word applied to who they are? One side is terrorist, the other side are state of Israel? Does that ultimately matter? No, in the eyes of the law, it doesn't matter. It's the actions that matter. So if what you're doing is collectively bombing people until you get what you want, then you're a criminal. Period. So right now, we have them bombing indiscriminately until they get their hostage back. Well, not even that. We have them denying their food and water and health to babies in incubators, to elderly people in hospital, to people on respirators, to people, everything. All these people are suffering now because they don't have electricity. They're dying as we speak because of what they're doing. And then people like Alex want to act like they're taking a moral stance by saying, we're going to let all those people suffer until you give us what we want, which are our hostages back, which matter. Of course, those people matter. But you're now literally weighing the scales and saying that the people we want matter more than all of the Palestinian civilians because, I guess, because you're a racist. I don't even know how you can tell me what you think on why you think those millions of people are less important than the hostages that are there. They're all important is the point. All of them equally. And that should matter, especially since we also know that Israel's bombing indiscriminately to the very areas that people that like they're saying they're trying to get back. The hostages, the Americans, 
UN members, many of which have already died. But somehow it's okay to keep indiscriminately bombing, but then also say we're not going to give you food until you give us those back as they bomb areas where they may be. I just, nobody can take this seriously. So anyway, the point is, he says that. AOC says this is collective punishment, which it very clearly is. Nobody can deny that. It's like the verbatim definition of, of collective punishment. We cannot starve nearly a million children to death over the horrific actions of Hamas, whose disregard for Israeli, Palestinian, and human life overall could not be more clear. That's very clear. She's saying they're bad. But we also must realize we can't starve children. Amazing that line is hard to take. This is what he says. Indeed, Madam Congresswoman, we have to draw a line. That was the last thing she said. We have to draw, we have to draw a line. Or wait, whoops. Right there, we must draw a line. And he says, and we have to draw a line. We will not tolerate murdering children, burning families. Okay, see, this is the same game they play. What does not tolerating acts from Hamas have to do with you targeting children or starving children or denying them water? It doesn't is the point. You can't pretend that your outrage over their actions by Hamas justify war crimes to children. But this is all this is an emotional ploy, and it's not going to last much longer. People are speaking up about this. The world is making taking notice to what's actually happening. But so he says, we won't tolerate the bad things Hamas did. The line has been crossed. We will fight the terrorist organization, Hamas, and destroy it. All the civilian population in Gaza is ordered to leave. Right. And you've been bombing them nonstop for seven days, round the clock, according to New York, the New York Times. You bombed the crossing they were supposed to leave through. You won't let them go into Israel, even though you tell them you're trying to protect them. And then you bomb the actual trucks in which they try to leave in. But yeah, let's pretend like you told them to leave and that's what's trying to This is everything about this is a lie. It says we will win. We will not receive a drop of water or they. So it's important to understand as some ridiculous person tried to argue this was about terrorism. They're saying all the civilian population is ordered to leave immediately. Now, the whole point is about collective punishment, which applies to the Palestinian civilians. The only people that we're talking about not getting water and food and energy are the civilians, right? And that's what she's talking about. That's what he's responding to. So first he does say we'll fight terrorism, but then he makes a point. All civilians are to leave and then follows that. That's how language works. And they will not receive a drop of water or a battery until they leave the world. So I'm sure they're going to play this as some sort of a misinterpretation, whatever you want it to be. The bottom line is, I think we actually know what's going on here. They won't get anything until they're gone. And possibly he meant dead. Either way, Ongoing collective punishment, if not direct threatening of their lives because they don't matter. Very clear. Now, here's an interesting point. All these people, the U.S. included, keep standing up and acting like we have a line. And the, the way they're presenting themselves is that everybody's behind them and you're the terrorist supporter, right? All of our people are in lockstep fighting against the terrorists. Well, that's not true. And I'm going to get to this at the end of the show, but I want to include this right here. In response to his comment about how they're fighting bad guys. Look at what these Israeli citizens are saying. And guys, look in the comments. It goes on. I mean, it's crazy. There's a lot. I mean, it's not ratioed, but it's getting close. 400 to 100 comments. And most of these people are saying stuff like this. This is an Israeli citizen in Hebrew saying, the government of the wretched, arrogant right-wing pro, uh, profligates. Or, I forgot to even know what that it looks up. Let's see. That's a uh, profligate. I haven't heard that word before. Recklessly extravagant, wasteful. Full of uh, uh, conists and Nazi Hamas who slaughtered our citizens and soldiers without restraint. Arguing that they're on the same side, guys. You planned to break up the country with wild incitement to drag us into civil war. That's what they're saying. The IDF will defeat the Nazi Hamas that you mindlessly nurtured for years. Wow. The people will defeat you. Hit, they're talking to the Israeli government member here. The poison machine you built against the citizens of Israel and the country. Wow. So one, you are Hamas. You're working with them is what they're telling them. That you're not actually trying to fight them. That we will and we'll get rid of you. And the fact that we'll defeat the IDF and the Nazi Hamas that you nurtured. Or rather the IDF will, excuse me, without with him out of the way. That's who they're talking to. Here's another one. This person says, again, in, in Israeli, in Hebrew, tagging Netanyahu, and in, in, an intestinal worm will begin to escape. I'm not sure what that means exactly. The entire Jewish people will come to account with the conspirators 
who destroy the state led by traitor Netanyahu, who destroys Israel. You and the members of the criminal gang that dismantled the country will be targeted and prosecuted until the end of days on earth. Remember, we just showed you two videos of members of Israeli government being yelled out of hospitals because of what's going on in Palestine. May you not have one night free from nightmares of the screams of slaughtered Israelis. You have to understand, they are blaming him for what happened in Israel, not what's going on. I mean, I get, there are discussions also about what they're doing to Palestinians, but it's far more slanted towards you allowed us to be killed. So think about this. And again, I'm going to get this to the end. If you have Israelis who are actually arguing, as far as I can tell, what seems to be a huge portion of the population saying you either let this happen or they're working with you or you pretended to be them and that allowed us to die or you killed us. And that is because of some agenda you're trying to carry out. Why wouldn't we ask that question if you see Israelis making that point? And I'm talking some people that are pretty high level Israeli citizens. We'll get to some in the end. So couldn't that possibly mean that the people that were killed at the music festival in their minds were killed by them or people that they were working with in order to blame Hamas or attack Palestinians or destroy Israel, whatever they think is happening? That's crazy. It's pretty fascinating. But you're not going to hear this from the corporate media. You're not going to hear this from anything other than people online right now. On top of that, right now there's a protest outside of the ministry that grows with calls for Netanyahu to resign. Get this. They started outside the defense ministry in Tel Aviv, literally by a family member of one of the people who was being held hostage by Hamas. And they're protesting Netanyahu. You have to realize that the, the world's telling us, the media is telling you that Netanyahu's on this crusade to fight Hamas and everybody supports him. These are people who have a hostage of Hamas and they're protesting Netanyahu. I mean, that's pretty alarming. That's, that's an important point in all this. Many hold signs with the names and pictures of those missing or held captive after the Hamas assault. And it says others wave Israeli flags and signs saying Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is responsible for the devastating failure and calling on him to resign. Now you could argue this is just about the idea that he failed somehow and allowed it to happen. But you have to understand the history and the proof. I already I went over it in the last show coming from the Wall Street Journal, from any, like, in any number, I mean, provable sources. Ron Paul admitted this in front of Congress, that they created Hamas. And then I guess the argument is they lost control of it, but that, that's questionable, I think. And even Vanessa Bealey argued that there are still factions within it that are somewhat loyal to U.S. and Israel. So it begins to become a little bit more complicated, doesn't it? There's also this argument from October 8th, right after this started. For years, Netanyahu propped up Hamas. So there you go. Times of Israel. Now it blows up in our faces. There's no misunderstanding that. They're telling you that Netanyahu is working with this group and now it's caused a problem. So either they lost control of it or, I mean, it's up for you to decide. That is not what we're being told. I think that's super important to this conversation. Now, this is an international lawyer who is calling out the member of, par of, of the government of Israel, saying that we won't give them anything until they leave the world. And he's simply saying another genocidal statement by another Israeli official and the civilized world is watching. I believe that. I think this is shifting as we speak. Now, here is that same minister responding to a U.N. tweet that literally says Gaza Strip, nearly one million people have been displaced in just one week. In and of itself, that's a crime. In the past 12 hours alone, hundreds of thousands of people have been displaced. The exodus continues as people move to southern parts of Gaza while they're bombing now that part as well, or have been the entire time. Here's what he says. We will not let up, and we will not stop. So collective punishment, on the record. Hamas is responsible for what is happening. That does not re remove them from responsibility because they just keep blaming them. Again, I make the analogy because it's it's not me a joke. It's just it's exactly what's happening, where you take your brother's hands and you stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself. Right? You are bombing them and saying that it's your fault because you don't do what we want. That is disgusting. It's authoritarian. It is. I, I mean, I'm trying to think of words these days that are so far like this is something beyond what we've ever seen, in my opinion, at least in my lifetime. This is unbelievable. On water, on the water, the electricity, on everything, he says, nothing is going to happen. And they're not going to give anything back. The purpose of this movement is to the South is to prevent the Hamas murderers from using the population as human shields, even though, again, as Robert points out, the U.N.'s even proved that's not true. 
has proven that that's not what they're doing. We covered this already. According to the UN report, there's no evidence that they were ever using human shields. If you don't believe that, we already covered this in a previous show. It's per the United Nations. Doesn't mean it's not happening, but the point is there's been no evidence of that, despite repeated claims by Israel, even though you can prove Israel has a stated policy of doing that. They just frame it as something else. And this is, they say, to save lives and remove the threats of the Nazis, because that's the clump, that's the best they have today. Let's just call, let's just bring it back to World War II because everyone's going to be afraid to draw a parallel or accuse you of saying that that's not true, even though it is. You're literally calling a group that you created Nazis as you fund Nazis in Ukraine. Maybe somebody should connect the dots. Hey, we will at the end of the show. BBC presenter calling out this lie. The Israelis would say, well, look, we are defending ourselves. We're targeting Hamas, right? That's what we were just talking about. This is what an honest person looks like. Somebody who is fed up with the fact that all these talking head morons are just repeating the absolute ridiculous claim that that somehow makes sense. I'm glad somebody had the courage to call it out. I would say, well, look, you know, we are defending ourselves. We are targeting <coughs> Hamas targets in Gaza. We are trying to put an end uh, to what we believe is a terrorist organization once and for all. Do you really keep a straight face when you say that? Do you think terrorist organizations embedded in populations who are denied their most basic rights are ended once and for all in a military campaign. Does that happen in history? Can someone credibly tell me that when the leadership of a country says, we are cutting off food, electricity, water, all supplies to an entire civilian population, that they're targeting militants? I'm sorry, these kind of lies can't be allowed to pass. Yes. And when you tell yourself the lie, it leads to the wrong policy. If anyone told me <clears throat> that what the militants did on the weekend was a legitimate response to years and years of occupation, I would say, no, you're wrongheaded. You've lost sight of humanity and reality. And if that anyone tells me that what Israel is doing in Gaza today is a legitimate response to what happened on the weekend, it's exactly the same. And I'm going to make a point so you aren't clear what I'm saying. I'm talking about the violence committed on civilians. I'll make a point about the actual legality of, of, of violent, uh, of, of armed resistance. And yet they are saying it. And yet the international community is. This makes me so, I, this is what we have to realize these people are. This woman, he makes a very clear point. And she goes, but people are saying it though. Like clearly, like aren't we, like aren't we supposed to follow along? Isn't that what we all do is just meekly follow what we're supposed to do i know that's not what she said but like just, it's just ridiculous wrong-headed you've lost sight of humanity and reality and if anyone tells me that what israel is doing in gaza today is a legitimate response to what happened on the weekend it's exactly the same and yet they are saying it and yet the international community is yes, saying and that you, and people need to challenge them on it right. because it's a lie and we're warmongering if we allow them to get away with it exactly now, look, there's thousands of examples you could make here, right? The idea of, like, let's just take apartheid South Africa, which, by the way, there were claims just like this. Let's not forget Israel being absolutely a part of that. The idea that South Africa at the time could have said, or the, or they could have been saying that these people were militants and that we have a right to defend ourselves and that we're going to bomb the population because they're, you know, it's the same argument, but it doesn't apply. And you could look at any different situation. The idea that they pretend that by acting a or a universally to every single person there is somehow only about the population they're targeting. It is ridiculous. It's never been, I've never seen anybody make this argument before. And all of these following authoritarians are nodding along like Blinken and not saying a word. That think, thank you to P. Rosen for posting this. I'd use this image for my, for my show today. Just simply breaking down the very basic, very basic, and I, and I include the actual link to this, by the way, so you can look at the Geneva Convention specifically as it relates to civilian persons in time of war. All They're all in here. I even have them highlighted for the actual articles, but they're exactly what it says here. So I'm just going to read them on here. Article three, persons taking no active part in the hostilities shall in all circumstances be treated humanely. It doesn't say, but, but, but if they have hostages, doesn't say that. It's the same thing the game they play with COVID. They, it doesn't say, you know, you have these rights, but unless there's an emergency, that's not how that works but they always play this game. Okay, the point is, in all circumstances, to be treated humanely without any adverse distinction found on race, color, religion, faith, sex, birth, or wealth, or any other similar criteria. 
Article 33, no protected person may be punished for an offense he or she has not personally committed. That's most important because that is literally what's happening right now. Collective penalties and likewise all measures of intimidation or of terrorism are prohibited. Doesn't matter. They're breaking that law right now. It is prohibited to attack destroy, remove, or render useless objects indispensable to the survival of the civilian population. That has been going on for seven days. Schools, hospitals, apartment buildings, everything. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. Now here is a very embarrassing, and it's the point somebody just made the other day, contradiction. Even one of the most ridiculous people out there who already made the argument that everything that's happening over here is okay. Here's what she says if you just swap out the people who we're talking about. Targeted attacks on civilian infrastructure with a clear aim to cut off men, women, children of water, electricity, and heating with the winter coming, these are acts of pure terror. And we have to call it as such. Israel has the right to defend now, here's what she, she, she just said very clearly, that doing so is a war crime. Then you just jump into a new topic, and she says, Israel cuts off water, food, electricity from civilians, and they all clap. Or, or rather, that Israel's right to defend itself, and they all clap. And that's when they're doing literally what she just described, that Russia would do about bad, 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 bad guy. <laughs> I mean, it's just insulting, man. The European Union stands with Israel, even though she has no authority to make that statement for all of the European Union in the context of actual action. But, you know, nobody cares. So this is the other point. Thank you. This is where we got that, that link from. So thank you to P. Rosen for pointing that out. Now, here is a Chinese senior diplomat who's asking who's ensuring the survival of the Palestinian people as fighting between Israeli forces and the Palestinian group Hamas is intensified. And the Western media's pro-Israel propaganda flooded in. He says, quote, the Israeli people have received assurances of their survival. But who's ensuring the survival of the Palestinian people? Oops, right? Obviously, there's a, a, a contradiction there. Nobody is, is the point. So without saying it, one side matters more than the other. The Israeli nation is no longer in a state of a dispor di uh, uh, diaspora. So the point is, they're not, they're, they, they're not scattered around. But when, we, when will the Pal Palestinian nation be able to return to their homeland? In a world where various injustices exist, the injustice faced by the Palestinians has lingered for over a half century. Spanning multiple generations and causing immense suffering, it cannot continue any longer. People are speaking up, guys. It's very important that we begin to acknowledge, that we, that we point this out and we make sure people see what's really going on. And make sure that they know that it's not a once, it's not what people are making it out to be who are screaming on Twitter. It's more, it's it's obvious that people are breaking the law. And I think we need to make sure everybody sees that. Going to the next category. This is about the idea of human shields, the idea of international law, and the idea that we can have somebody from the UN stand up and say something so willingly deceptive, in my opinion. Here's what he said. Immediate humanitarian access throughout Gaza so that we can get fuel, food and water to everyone in need. Even wars have rules. Right. So first of all, now after seven days of bombing, suddenly we care about the civilians needing stuff. Where were you before? Right. Well, now I think what's shifted is suddenly they want to make it out to seem like they need to do this. And this is the same thing. Everything shifted. The U.S., Israel, they all suddenly say, oh, wait, we're going to get them out of the way. So clearly they're aware that I think people are paying attention to what's going on. And maybe they didn't expect that. The bottom line is it doesn't take seven days to not go. And where are your calls for ending the, the indiscriminate bombing? The point is they're not letting it happen. They're not letting the aid in. But that's what he's pointing out, that we need to let aid in. OK, but when they don't do it, are you going to say something about it? International humanitarian law and human rights law must re be respected and upheld. Yeah, it's not, though. It's not. They haven't been for 75 years. But let's just pretend like repeatedly stating that makes you on the side of good. Civilians must be protected. And, and they're not. And also never use the shields. 
Right. And that's a, that's a nod to pretend like that's what's happening on Palestinian side, even though we can prove it's not. And on top of that, the UN itself has acknowledged that there's no evidence of that, even though, again, we can prove Israel does it on a regular basis. And all hostages in Gaza must be released immediately. Aha. Well, here's an interesting point about this. This is what Robert shared with me earlier. Here's his uh, response. He says the UN is claiming that POWs have, have to be released during the war according to international law, which is a lie. He's also using the human shields propaganda, which the UN itself debunked, which I've discussed. The war is just proving how corrupt and biased all of these institutions are on every level. His point is interesting, right? Because if we're talking about POWs, prisoners of war, which is really what we're talking about here, under international law, here's the, here's the rule for wartime. POWs cannot be prosecuted for taking a direct part in hostilities. Their detention, that, that does not uh, over, that if there's crimes committed, right, civilians attacked and so on, that's still a crime. What they're talking about is in, in legal, legal acts of war. You can't then somehow bring them into trial for shooting people during war. Now, that's an interesting point. You know why? Because the U.S. government claims Iranian military are all terrorists because they defended the illegal occupation of Iraq with the Iraqis when the U.S. invaded. So my point is these people don't care about international law. They use it as they wish and lie about it when they want to. It says, but the law says, continuing, their detention is not a form of punishment, like it shouldn't be is the point, but only aims to prevent further participation in the conflict. So you're not allowed to hurt them, beat them up, which is what's happening. It happens in war on every side all the time, which is disgusting. The point is, technically, they're only supposed to be locked up and held and fed and taken care of until the conflict is over. It says they must be released and repatriated without delay after it's over. So that's what's interesting. The argument is, that to set that to argue they have to be released now or from Israel's perspective that they're going to bomb until they release them. Well, that in, in and of itself violates international law. What about the 5,000 Palestinians that have been detained for years without charge? Right. So either you're in a war and those are POWs, which means both sides can hold them until the conflict is resolved, or you're both holding hostages, except one side says 5,000, the other side, side has 100 or 50 or whatever they're claiming. I mean, these facts matter, guys. We'll get to that point in a second about the, the I, I made earlier. Then it says the detaining power may prosecute them for possible war crimes, right? So that, that should happen for people that are being held or rather people that should be gone after in regard to what happened as really civilians, but the same thing should happen in reverse to all the civilians that are right now being killed. But it says the detaining power may prosecute them for war crimes, but not for acts of violence that are lawful under the international law. Interesting, right? So why is this UN guy standing up and making the argument that they have to release them? Well, because they're calling them hostages because they're pretending these are terrorist acts and blah, blah, blah. That's how this game is being played. Now, you can argue that the acts were crimes that targeted civilians, but you cannot pretend this is some kind of terrorist act when it's an occupied territory under the United Nations, which it is. And I, and I'll give you a hundred examples of how we know it's an occupied Palestine, according to every human rights group, the United Nations. And then we could talk about the Geneva Conventions, right? And the reality that Palestinians or any occupied territory legally has a right to armed re rebellion, struggle, whichever term you want to use. That's a fact. So those things being objective fact, as I've said every show we've done this now, when they rise up and act, that is legal. And then crimes committed or not. Well, you don't invalidate the legal standing of the act because other people committed crimes. It's the point they made about any other war in the West. If that's, our, if that's the argument, then literally every war committed is invalidated, which, again, you can make arguments for why they're illegal in the first place for taking illegal action as the United States government, but they'll argue otherwise. But the point is, if you're trying to pretend like that invalidates something and makes them all now terrorists, well, then every U.S. military member is a terrorist or any other entity we're talking about, right? It, 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 that's what they talk about when they mean the equal application of international law. You don't get to pick and choose which way you look at it when, it when it's your side versus the other. Isn't that interesting, right? So my point earlier, especially since here we know, let me finish that actually, the point about, so if they're calling it hostages, what they're trying to make you think is that this is some kind of a terrorist act and they have to release them now because if they engage with it as international law and knowing the legal reality of the occupation and armed rebellion, well, then they're allowed to keep them. And that's not that. And then that invalidates the whole argument of bombing until they release them. But realize, even if they were hostages, bombings populations of civilians never, ever becomes OK. There's really no way out of this. What they did was one of the biggest war crimes I've seen in my lifetime. And it's still happening. And people are going to not going to stop pushing. They shouldn't.
But here's the point. Knowing this in occupied territory, knowing they have a legal right to armed rebellion, and it does not condone the acts of violence against civilians, but knowing those first two parts, realistically, they could stand here and say, you need to give us back our 5,000 detained civilians, which most of them are, which is even according to the human rights groups, not charged for years, going on a decade for some of them. And if we don't, we're going to bomb all of your civilians indiscriminately. Isn't that exactly what Israel says they're going to do? They're not going to, they won't say we're bombing civilians. Then let's say Hamas says, we're going to target your IDF and do our best not to kill civilians. But you know, there's going to be some collateral damage because you have our hostages and we want them back. Isn't that exactly the same thing? Uh-huh, it is. It's exactly the same thing. You're not going to hear that from people because they don't want to make that case because they're going to get attacked. You're going to call racist. You're going to, they're denying the Holocaust, whatever they're going to say to you, even though none of that's true, even though I'm actively defending Civilians in Israel, civilians in Gaza, civilians anywhere, because I care about all of them. But it's really disgusting to pretend like it only works one way. And you get the point. 5,000 civilians and or 5,000 people held without charge in Israel. And this only works one way. Well, here is the United Nations Human Rights Council making it very, very clear that one, it's an occupied territory, but two, that they have continued to arbitrary detain, arbitrarily detain these people. For years, where was all the people screaming then? Where was all the human rights group? Where was the United Nations? Where was the U.S. government going? Hey, you're illegally holding people without charge, you democracy. In 1967, Israel has detained approximately one million Palestinians in the occupied territory, including tens of thousands of children. That's, that's the whole time, by the way. One million, including tens of thousands of children. Now, now the, 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 the current detention is over 5,000, but think about that. The, the sheer breadth of how long that's been going on with no legal justification. One million Palestinians in the occupied territory, including tens of thousands of children. Currently, there are 5,000 Palestinians in Israeli prisons, including 160 children, and 1,100 of them are detained without charge or trial. 160 children detained in Israeli prisons, some of them without charge. Children. But we're going to pretend like this all makes sense, right? Let me be clear from the outset. I do not condone any acts of violence that the Palestinians might have committed or might commit while living under an unlawful occupation or in, in the pursuit to end it. However, we must acknowledge that most Palestinians have been convicted through a series of violations of international law, such as discrimination, persecution, and breaches of due process and for ordinary acts of life in the exercise of legitimate rights. I found the widespread and systemic, systemic arbitrary deprivation of liberty of Palestinians is a structural component of the regime that Israel has imposed upon them. You know, it's just so infuriating that we can have the, the, you know, what they in other circumstances point at as the highest law of the land kind of stuff, saying exactly what they call racist. That this is an apartheid state, it's an illegal occupation, that they're doing this unlawfully, and, and even calling them out to, I mean, and yet it just doesn't stop. Now her point here about not committing, you know, it doesn't, doesn't uh, justify violent action, right? Now I, I feel like a lot of people are in the, mind, the point of saying that because they're trying to make sure that they're not going to be called out for justifying what other people say are violent acts. But again, let's make sure we understand this reality, which I've said many times. So this, this is, first of all, MS International, just so we understand that this is undeniably an occupied territory, despite the screaming narratives of people that claim who just reinvent history to make it seem like this didn't happen. Israel's continuing oppressive and discriminatory system of governing Palestinians in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories constitutes a system of apartheid. Very clear. And Israeli officials committed the crime of apartheid under international law. Israeli forces launched a three-day offensive on the occupied Gaza Strip in August, during which they committed apparent, clear war crimes. Nothing ever happened, though. What do you know? This compounded the impact of the 15-year uh, ongoing Israeli blockade that amounts to illegal collective punishment. It's right there, just continuing to this day, and further fragments Palestinian territory. 
Israel escalated its crackdown on Palestinians' freedom of association. All crimes. It also imposed arbitrary restrictions on freedom of movement and closures that amounted to collective punishment, mainly in the Northern West Bank, ostensibly in response to armed attacks by Palestinians on Israeli soldiers and settlers. Again, the idea being this is armed resistance. He's talking about settlers and soldiers. That's the point. Armed settlers. We just told you this. The point is this is about resistance, and we're going to get into that next. So this is not about proving that that's terrorism. They have the right to do whatever they want, even though that doesn't even apply. It says the year saw a rise in the number of Palestinians unlawfully killed, and, and that, that's, that's clear, and seriously injured by Israeli forces. Administrative detentions of Palestinians hit a 14-year high, and torture and other ill treatments continued. According to one of the leading human rights groups in the world, Israel is literally torturing Palestinians. Israel forces demolished the uh, al Arakib village and the Negev Nakab for the 211th time. I mean, I can't even understand how that's possible. That this one village has been destroyed 211 times? Like, I'm wondering if that's a typo. Like, that is unbelievable. The fact that they destroy an entire village once or right now, seemingly all of Gaza, should be unbelievable. But 211 times? Now think about being displaced over and over and over and over. The further 35 Palestinian Bedouin towns in Israel were still denied formal recognition, and that's how they get them displaced again and again, because they just refuse to acknowledge that they exist there. So when they want to build a park, they go, oh, you don't have a permit, get out of the way, even though they've been applying for one for 50 years. And, re and, and res residents faced possible forcible transfer. Exactly. Authorities failed to process asylum claims for thousands of asylum seekers and imposed restrictions on the right to work. I mean, this is apartheid to the extreme. Now, my point is, occupied, clearly. Illegal actions, clearly. My point then is that under the Geneva Conventions, they have a right to armed struggle, which means, in some cases, violent action against armed forces, not civilians. And if they attack civilians, then they have to be charged with a crime. But you cannot deny their armed struggle. Now, this is just Al Jazeera talking about it. You can read the article for yourself. Here, I have included the Geneva Convention edition. Uh, this is the uh, Protocol 1 discussion, at which gets into that point. But the reality is it's, it's internationally acknowledged, guys. It's not a secret. An occupied territory has always had the right to armed rebellion. Now, in case you didn't catch it when I briefly mentioned it before. Turns out we do have a place that's not allowed to defend itself. Isn't that interesting? I mean, so I've been saying to myself, well, there's no one in the world not allowed to. Well, we found one, right? John White says, Palestine has the right to defend itself. And guess what everybody says? This guy says, the elected government of Gaza just targeted large civilian populations for murder, rape, and kidnapping, which is not what happened. They have a right to surrender, maybe, and spare their population collateral damage. They'll suffer as a result, but they won't. You know why? Effing cowards. Oh, so, so they don't. Okay, got it. So because Hamas did something bad, apparently Gaza as a right doesn't have to defend itself. So I got my answer. Apparently in the, all of the world, only Palestine does not have the right to defend itself. Got it. Same. This guy responds, they also have the right to leave or die. Great. We're, we're dealing with some very rational people here. So this person says, so their only options are genocide or ethnic cleansing? Okay, exactly. Think about that for a second. That's what's literally, this people are literally dealing with this mentality. You can get out of the way or you can die. So again, you need to be killed or ethnically cleansed or displaced. But think about the argument here, right? Isn't that the same thing we're, we're being, Israel's right to defend itself, which seems to whitewash whatever they do. Why doesn't it work both ways? Well, you know why. Now, here is the uh, United Nations, specifically for the Palestinian refugees, saying Iceland's con contribution will be channeled through this, this group one of the longstanding humanitarian partners. The point is, Iceland is sending 70 million ISK in response to the United Nations calling for humanitarian support. Not Israel. This is the UN trying to get aid through even though Israel won't let it. Now, what they're going to do is try to get this somehow to this specific agency, which right now is holed up inside of Gaza with over 200,000 people in a hospital where they have already had 30 children and 11 of their members killed because of the bombings in their family's homes, by the way. Still holding it out. So think about the courage there. But the point is, they're saying it. We're, we're going to, Iceland can send to us and we're going to do our best to get the support to the Palestinians. Even though legally, Israel has an obligation to help the people they're occupying. 
Same point. Scotland is answering the same call, sending what they can to help. Here is what Homza Yusuf said. The Scotland government will provide 500,000 pounds toward the United Nations Relief Agency flash appeal in response to the ongoing escalation in Gaza Strip. The human corridor must be open to allow supplies, and they're not letting it happen. They're bombing things that try to come through. They even threatened, according to corporate reports, they threatened to bomb Egypt trying to bring in support. That already happened. That was a couple days ago. Think about that. Now, here is the same person we're talking about, and this is the UK government does not value, listen to what they're saying, the UK government does not value the lives of Palestinians as much as Israelis, according to Scotland's first minister, Humza Yusuf, which is interesting because people are attacking him now for taking the side of the, or just not the side of Palestinians, but the side of civilians on any side. Now here, interestingly enough, is the president of South Africa. Right, formerly apartheid South Africa. Isn't that interesting? So you, somebody who would know, guys, what apartheid is. Guess what side he's taking. Members, as you can see, this is the National Executive Committee. All of us standing here pledging our solidarity to the people of Palestine. We stand here because we are deeply concerned about the atrocities that are unfolding in the Middle East. And we have passed our condolences to the people of Israel as we are passing our condolences to the people of Palestine. And we have a full understanding of how the people of Palestine have taken up this issue because they are people as many countries and leaders in the world have uh, uh, opined that they have been under occupation for almost 75 years and people under occupation who have been waging a struggle against an oppressive government that has occupied their land but also a government that has in recent times been dubbed an apartheid state as people and an organization that has struggled against an oppressive system of apartheid we do pledge solidarity with the palestinians and as the african national congress we have always pledged our solidarity with them and we've always insisted that the only solution for the problems in the Middle East, particularly between Israel and Palestine, is a two-state solution based on the 1967 borders as approved by the world community and the United Nations. The only problem is that the Palestinians have been okay with that for a while, in some cases. Today, I think things have changed, but there's been many instances where that was something that they were striving for. Like, just give us our own state. Let us lead our own lives. And the point is that if you really understand it, I mean, they scream that the Palestinians are attacking us and that's why it won't happen or whatever the narrative is. The point is you can prove every single time, as I've shown you many times from as long as I've been covering this topic, that the Israeli government openly says we will never, ever let them have their own state. Not a one state, not a two state, nothing. We will never let them have their own state. Well, in the sense of the one state, I argue like arguing that they're part of that state, but that, that's not on the table either. Clearly. The point, though, is that they've made that clear. And what's even more embarrassing is you get people like Biden or people that will stand up, whoever's in power, and tell their populations that Israel wants this and the Palestinians. And then that same moment, you can listen to them elsewhere going, we'll never allow that. That's never going to happen. So is Biden too stupid to know he's wrong or is he lying to you or does he not care or any of them? Trump did the same thing. So did Obama. They all lie to you guys. That's the point. It's all the same damn thing. Now, the violation of the rights of the Palestinians that has manifested itself through the occupation of their land, through bringing in settlers so close and into their land, is something that is causing a great deal of concern and has possibly sparked off this conflict that is now unfolding. The atrocities that are happening now where the residences of 
people in that part of the world are being raised to the floor. Pregnant mothers are not even able to give birth in a respectable manner. Hospitals are being raised to the floor. And, but the worst part is when the Israeli government now says 1.1 million people must evacuate the northern part of Gaza. Having closed all the exit routes, now we do believe that this is a serious matter of great gravity and concern. The world sees it, guys. And to this end, we've called on the international community, the United Nations, and all other concerned international bodies to make sure that peace is installed in Palestine and that the Israeli government is directed at withdrawing this command of getting people out of the northern part of Gaza because it is in the end going to amount to almost genocide as many people are going to die. As we speak now, almost half a million people who are Palestinians have been displaced. They've been removed from their homes. They live in schools and other areas as well. Just imagine this is your family, your mother, your cousins, your daughter, your, your, your grandmother, and you guys are all huddled together in some school with everybody bleeding and dying around you because you have nowhere else to go. Don't, can't afford to go anywhere else, too afraid to take the trip because you don't have food or water, and you're just stuck. You're, all of your belongings have been destroyed for the third time in your, in your life, maybe in your, your family history, and nobody cares. Everyone keeps calling you the terrorist. Think about what that does to your mind. This is the most tragic situation and almost dangerous situation that the people of Palestine have been exposed to. And we have called for the humanitarian corridors to be open so that food, water, and electricity can be made available to the people of Gaza. Now, the point you get from people like Alex and the rest is, oh, well, we're going to give aid to our enemies. Well, sure, maybe that will translate to some people in Gaza being Hamas, getting food and water. The bottom line is you, it's never historically been a valid argument to starve the population of all civilians in order to just not help the bad guys who are there. Especially since we're not even really understanding the full situation if you're just simply framing them all as terrorists. It's unbelievable to me. The other concern we have, of course, is that this conflict could actually go beyond the borders of Israel and Palestine and engulf the entire Middle East into a conflict that the world least deserves at this point in time. We are faced with many other conflicts on our own continent and in other parts of Europe, the Russia-Ukraine conflict another one that needs to be brought to an end. So South Africa and the African National Congress, we stand firm on the peaceful resolution of conflicts. And we also stand ready to participate on a neutral basis, as we always do in various conflicts around the world whether the parties that are involved in a conflict share the same position as ourselves ideologically or not, we've always participated in the ending of conflicts. I'll leave it, I'll leave it there. There's a couple more minutes left of it, but you get the general point of it. By the way, I was looking at my phone just now, and Tim Poole just shared that video of the Hamas members with the children. Saying, say, and by the way, that was tweeted by that same guy we showed you, already tweeted and deleted, that killing the Palestinian children was just getting rid of those little time bombs and it was okay. So that shows you his mentality about the Palestinian side, right? And the idea of saying that they're showing them smiling, laughing, not hurting the children, which again, certainly could be that they're holding them hostage and that's completely unacceptable. But I don't have any more context than that. 
it's interesting how the first narrative is they're slaughtering everybody, including all the babies and children. And then you get a video of them rocking them gently and moving their cribs and carrying them around. And maybe it's all propaganda, certainly possible. But then instead of just going, they fake that and they're killing them all, you go, they're holding them now. Instead, we change our narrative in mid-turn because something else happened that you can see. That does not seem honest to me. And of course, coming from somebody who openly paraded and cheered for Palestinian children being killed, I kind of don't take his, take his statement seriously. But either way, as somebody commented underneath that Tim Pool is mainstream media, I happen to agree with that. Either way, let's end this general point today. Well, actually, I think I've got two things to get into. Oh, that's right. Okay, so first, we're going to go through this video. This is of, again, uh, Efrat Fangenson. Or I think I think it's Fennig Fen Fennigson. How, how do you say that properly? Let me know in the chat. Give me the phonics spelling. I don't. I I think she's doing some interesting work here. I think it's important for you guys to look at. But she is discussing what we talked about before. Here's the first sentence. I'll just play it for you. The people of Israel have been. She goes. I don't know if sacrificed is too rough of a word, but we have been sold out. Very interesting. Take a listen to this possibly explain such a failure. Incompetence seems inadequate to explain it. Now, you're in a position to say more about this because you have, you have manned that border. Yeah. It's very hard for me to talk about it. And don't forget, I should have said that, which he alluded to. She was in the IDF, as a lot of Israeli citizens are, a lot, most of them, I think. Either way, so she was in it. She manned that fence before. Already put up videos in the very beginning going, there's no way this was just a random surprise. There's no way. And she's been holding that line. And now she's, it's pretty powerful. Because it's, um... <laughs> and I believe she's in Israel, by the way, where she's, I think that's where she's broadcasting from. There are so many friends and family members of friends that are missing and have been taken hostage in this barbar barbaric act that talking about what I know feels like, sometimes feels like, why is this important now? And at the same time, I know that if we don't talk about this, then we will just let them off the hook once. Right. And so this is where I, this is why I like her. Whether or not we agree on everything, it's, it seems clear to me that she, her interest is the truth. And in this moment, what she's alluding, what she's pointing at right there is what everybody else is dealing with in a lot of cases where she knows something's wrong, but in many people just go, oh, well, I'm going to leave it alone because like you said, you're like, is it important now? Like the argument is, we have all these atrocities happening. How dare you talk about whether they were responsible? Well, what, what, what do you mean? How dare you? Is it true or not? Doesn't the truth matter to you? Wouldn't it change if you realize they allowed it to happen? It just shows you emotional manipulation at the end of the day, whether they mean to or not. And I, what I love is that she decided I'm going to go forward anyway, because the truth matters. I really appreciate that. Again, because to me, and, and I will explain why I think this, this is a great atrocity. Um, because to me, this is, it's, I don't know how to say it. It's just, the people of Israel have been, I don't know if sacrifice is too rough of a word, but we have been sold and sold, uh, out. sold out completely and uh, no help for hours and hours and no military involvement, no police, no arms on the ground. Let's not forget, and I didn't include this, that's why I'm going to say it now, that we already have confirmed reports from two mainstream outlets that they moved the location of that concert right before to a very, very unsecure location. And, and, and there's, a, there's a bunch more involved there, but it's very suspicious about whether or not that was part of what's going on and what she's talking about. For hours and hours, this is something that is non-typical and unusual for Israel Defense Forces. Now... I've served in the military forces 25 years ago as uh, I was in the intelligence uh, forces uh, based in the Gaza Strip, as I told you. And I know the security drills. When I served, there was no internet. So I would sit next to the phone in my uh, shift of the fence of the security of the Gaza Strip. And whenever something would move alongside the fence, I would get a phone call from the human observers that are looking at the gate um, telling us there is a chain of command that you have to notify when something like this happens. And then straight away, 
uh, forces come in to look at what is it and take it down. So what do you mean when something moves by the fence? How small is it? It can be a pig. It can be a cat moving alongside the fence or touching the fence or trying to cross the fence. An animal, they would identify it. They would see it. There are cat. A cat gets scrutiny. Would trigger, yeah, it could trigger the fence, yeah. And An animal. Twenty-five years later, with and twenty-five years sensors. later, with internet and with the most sophisticated high-tech weaponry systems, and there are drones, and there are helicopters, and there are troopers on the ground, and you know there are many things that are supposed to be activated. There are various lines of defense and layers of defense that are supposed to be activated when something like that happens. Okay, uh, so. But I just want to make this clear. I mean, it probably is, but you have a system that is sensitive to anything the size of a cat or bigger. That system, since you were uh, manning it, has had 25 years to mature and become more sensitive, to become more discerning. And yet, how many places was that border breached? Fifteen. Fifteen places. It's not more. Yeah. I didn't even know that until she reported. That's crazy. I knew it was multiple locations, but 15 different locations. I don't buy that. I mean, just simply based on the logistics and the people and, 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 and what she's obviously saying, something is obviously fishy. And that's why she's pushing this line because she it's backed up in her opinion by the facts. 15. And that is completely ridiculous because normally with one breach of the fence, the whole army is triggered. And things start moving presumably. immediately. Things start moving immediately. And here there was nothing for hours. Hmm. That is really interesting. So all, all I think, what I think is important here is just to ask yourself, right? Ask yourself whether or not, I mean, first of all, realizing what we just showed you and the different tweets and, and responses that's been, that have been going on from the very beginning. The protest to Netanyahu to resign, the fact that they say he was propping up Hamas, the fact that we can prove that they created Hamas, that they funded Hamas, and their people believe right up until this time he was propping them up and the U.S. government in the same light. And now you've got examples of people questioning whether or not and then tweeting that they think they let this happen, which could either mean that they were the ones that did it or they let these people in or they were... At, working with them. I mean, there's all these different ways you could look at it. I've seen different versions of people's opinions. So if we have a huge portion of the Israeli population or enough people who are saying they did this to us, shouldn't we then stand back and say, okay, wait a minute, just as an objective possibility, isn't it possible that this was not what we were told either that they were working with this group and that's who killed people. And now they're blaming that up to take care of Palestine in Gaza, or it was them that they let them in for the same reason. And then either either people did kill people because Hamas did that, or they then made that happen to make the case, or it was literally them pretending to be Hamas. All of those are real possibilities. All of those are things the Israeli government or the U.S. government have literally done before. Uh, so, and let's not forget that they have people that are operating on either side that are acting like the other. That's part of their intelligence apparatus. It's certainly possible. So all that being said, if you just floated that idea, people would, I mean, they're going to freak out anyway. I, like I care about that. The truth is all I care about. But when you have people like this who are actively telling you that this seems like something that there's too much to have gone on here that they could, they could have, there's no way they weren't involved. I think that says a lot that we should be considering that with every point we now talk about. Now, going into this, as my, my internet falls out, I don't know if I was going to drop out entirely. Here is CNN's video they just put out. That says, or I, oh, actually, I don't, I don't think it just came out, but either way, I don't think it's, it's not, it was after they reviewed the, of the, as it says, 50 videos, which I really love how they always try to act like they're, <laughs> so when we take internet off, in, videos off the internet and investigate them and pre present it, we're conspiracy theorists and we don't know what we're doing. But when they take 50 videos off the internet and do the same thing, that's, that's their investigation. Just, you know, it, they're ridiculous, is my point. But CNN apparently has verified more than 50 videos, which I don't even know what they mean by verified, like that their, their videos from the place. We all can see that. So that's their verification. How the deadly assault at the music festival unfolded. Hamas, and so they say the Hamas terrorists attacked the festival from three sides, trapping civilians and shooting all of them. That's, now, the narrative we get is the same thing Netanyahu said. They pinned them down and they shot them all dead. Well, we have 
evidence already, videos that I don't see them including, of security forces alongside them and inside the crowd of civilians firing from within the civilians. Why wasn't that included? Where are those security forces? Did they get killed? Are they part of the story? Are they part of the people who are being told were shot? Or are they alive and they can testify to what happened? I mean, there's a lot of interesting kind of anomalies to all of this. But when you watch this video, I have a point that I'll make about this same example. About whether, and we, by the way, we also have the example of people that seem to have come in on different vehicles that ominously look just like hum, like IDF, but with wearing a headband. Which again, they're 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 similar when you look at their outfits, but they are different. I found that very telling as well. But let's watch this video, and I'll make some points. <laughs> There's frustration, but no sense yet of the horror about to unfold. As news spreads of rocket attacks from Gaza, people begin seeking shelter, crouching close to the ground. But even this doesn't lead this. to outright panic. Rocket attacks visible here are a regular occurrence in this. Think about how ridiculous that is. You've literally got rockets flying into a densely civilian populated area and everyone, that's just Tuesday. <laughs> I just think that's just, that's ridiculous, by the way. And it doesn't become an issue until there's something happening right around them. Like to me, that just seems like a ridiculous thing to take at face value, that there's just rockets flying all the around. What happens if one goes haywire and bomb? That, that would scare me if they were right over the horizon, right? This part of Southern Israel. About 10 minutes later and some start heading to their cars. The decision of when and how to leave the festival would mean life or death for many. Now here's what's interesting to me. You got multiple angles of filming here and you'll take note that the only thing you ever see in any of this is outward video of the people involved. No, it, not even a single image that I can see other than the one CNN shows you of what they claim is Hamas. Doesn't that, it's interesting. And you'll see what I mean as we go through this. The vi there's no, there's no, like, like we've been saying the whole time. It's not like I'm denying this happened. What I'm saying though, as a journalist, when all you have is a kind of one-sided evidence, like a picture of something and they say, that's what happened. I'm going, well, seems like that's what happened, but just the image is easy to manipulate, especially in the age of digital manipulation as we've already seemingly proven. So this seems like, you'll see what I mean as it goes through the video. It doesn't seem like there's much to go on other than people were hurt. Because my point is, how do we know who hurt them? Especially as Israeli civilians are claiming their government was involved. And here's an interesting overlap. As they're saying, this is Israel's 9-11. Maybe that's more real than we think, more, more on the nose than we realize. Seeing as how we know in this country, 9-11 was a government false flag, right? And we should anyway. Some fled early to nearby bomb shelters. It's 7.10 a.m. and many are crammed inside this one to the north of the festival. But they've been followed. Okay, so now we, this is, we have this image from the inside, right? Now, I, I'm not suggesting that be, as there's people coming in that they would keep filming. I don't know. But we have this image from the inside. And then it just, it, it's so arguably you'd be able to see something begin. But then it just ends up being the people that were shot, and it's the aftermath, essentially. And many are crammed inside this one to the north of the festival, but they've been followed. At 7.24 a.m., Hamas threw a grenade inside, causing horrific damage. This man, Noam, emerges stunned into the daylight. And it's Okay, so here's the one we get one shot of what they say is Hamas throwing in a grenade into the shelter. Now, look, I, I'm not saying Hamas or any of these people or, or any of them, whether Israeli troops, U.S. troops, or any military, is not capable of just indiscriminately deciding to kill civilians. It's happened in every war I've ever seen. But in, in just in a circumstance with what the objectives appear to be, it doesn't make sense to me. doesn't mean it didn't happen. But the idea that, one, the hostages was the point, they slam, because they want to take get back their hostages. Now, also, I don't see much evidence of how many hostages they claim they're taking other than what we're told from the Israeli government. Like, if they have hundreds of hostages, I've only seen a few of the examples of who they are, where they come from, their family. Normally, we're inundated with that. Just entire documentaries of all the families speaking out about this stuff. So it doesn't prove it's not true. But it just, again, doesn't line up with what we're usually seeing. And all you get is this one image of what they say is Hamas throwing a grenade in with, and then, then that's associated with the image we just saw before it. If let's just say hypothetically, this was them lying about it. There's no evidence that shows what happened and who was responsible is my point. It's not the only shelter to be targeted. 30 minutes later and further down the same road, Hamas militants are caught on dash cam footage outside another shelter. They throw a grenade inside. In total, CNN has... You don't even hear it go off. Isn't that strange? Now, I, I, want, I wonder, 
if we have Israeli citizens believing that their government was responsible, do they believe they would go as far as to pretend to be them? Which I, I can prove to you they've done in the past. And as far then to take action to kill people to justify their actions. I'm yeah, That's up for the Israeli citizens to decide. But at the very least, they're saying that they allowed it to happen, which means they believe their government's capable of allowing them to be killed. So it's kind of a moot point, really. They identified four different shelters near the festival that Hamas attacked, all full of people. Over the next... Don't you think that they would be showing us this stuff? Not that we should be looking at gruesome realities, but... We've seen the way that they conduct themselves, and they would be, I think they would be parading this stuff around if they had the kind of evidence that showed entire shelters full of dismembered people. I have seen one of those that they showed you, that one video, and I just, I, have, I don't know who actually carried that out based on the now the added kind of suspicion from the Israeli government. Six hours, hundreds or, of excuse me, from the Israeli citizens, I meant. Millions were killed, hunted down as they tried to flee the festival. By examining over 50 videos of that morning and speaking to 12 survivors, CNN has established that Hamas surrounded the festival. Okay, so now what we get is the argument that CNN did the due diligence, which I find hard to not laugh about. But that then we just go, we looked at them and then here's our breakdown of what we perceive happened. I, I don't, that... I don't know why anybody would take CNN as a real entity, first of all, let alone trust their due diligence process. That's just me, though. Locking three approaches to the south, north and west, forcing people to flee across the fields to the east. Now, why would they do this? Like, think about this logically. Why, if their whole point was to, one, liberate Palestine or take hostages to free their own hostages, or maybe just take over Israel, why would they use forces to from three different angles for a big group of civilians? I guess because what they want you to think is they just wanted to murder everybody. But that rarely rings true for me, whether it's Assad or anybody for that matter. Like there's always a political objective around what's going on. The idea that they would do that just for the sake of making them run in a third direct or, you know, the opposite direction and then chase them down. Why wouldn't they surround them from all directions? I mean, it just, it's almost, if, if you want my honest opinion, based on what people are saying, it begins to feel like these people are being funneled into a clear direction for some kind of objective, which if you see how it turned out, it's only really benefiting one side here. The use of the fact that they were hurt to justify what they're doing to Palestinians. It's, it, and this is only because we see so many people in Israel who are the ones saying that their government let this happen. Even then, they were hunted. It's now 8.15 a.m. and Gal Bukshpan survives along with others by running across the fields. He's pictured here in the white t-shirt. No, no images of who's firing, what's happening, just that one shot of what they say is Hamas throwing a grenade into something and then they cut away. Police and security told them to drive... And where'd they get that video from? Who's filming them from 20 feet away to throw a grenade into something from a car? Is that their video and how'd they get that? East ...across rough land due to roadblocks on the main road but many end up fleeing on foot. We were like ducks. It was like a range. People were running in their hundreds. Um, and you can hear the bullets coming. Were you seeing anyone get shot? Yeah, you can see people fall. Which is sad, it's right? I mean, it's, it, it's sad because whether it was the Israeli government, whether it was Hamas, or whether it was people acting as Hamas, or people in Hamas are working for the Israeli government, the point is people were being hurt. And that's terrifying. It's sad. And nobody should pretend like that doesn't matter. The Israeli civilians that were hurt matter just as much as the Palestinians that were being hurt or killed. Simple as that. And anybody saying otherwise is disgusting. But the point is, we should be able to logically break this down and ask the hard questions, especially when everyone's at a fever pitch about emotion. That's when journalists should actually do their jobs. 8.30 a.m. and as Gal and others continued running east, others running north met with more bullets and a police blockade. A police blockade? I just find that interesting. Why was there a police blockade at 8.30 in the morning? Aren't we told that they had 15 locations where the nobody was around, yet they have a blockade set up on a road that was meeting people coming away, coming from the one direction they were allowed to run from? Think about that for a second, right? So they come from three sides and drive them into a field which runs them right into a police blockade of the Israeli government? <laughs> I mean, that doesn't really make sense to me, especially at the time they're telling us when these people were breaking through with nobody there.
Something does not make sense here. And I think we really need to wonder whether this was something that was carried out, even allowing people to die or doing it themselves to justify what's currently taking place. Again, especially since we put in the beginning, we talked about months ago, them deciding that we're going to take back Gaza or discussing that as the government. And stating that that would come along with a lot of casualties. Well, maybe they meant both sides. Now, again, remember, just to show you so we don't forget, here are the Israeli citizens in Hebrew responding to a member of government saying, you did this. The entire people will account for the conspirators who destroy the state and the traitor Netanyahu destroys Israel. You and members of the criminal gang that dismantled the country will be targeted and persecuted until the end of your days. Here's the other one. And it says, uh, may you not have one night free from the nightmares of the screams of slaughtered Israelis. The government of the wretched, arrogant, right-wing uh, profiligates full of uh, uh, Khanists and Nazi Hamas who slaughtered our citizens and soldiers without restraint. You planned to break up the country with wild incitement and drag us into civil war. Clearly suggesting that they're doing this at the expense of people's lives to get what they want. They say the IDF will defeat Hamas that you mindlessly nurtured for many years. So don't forget that. That's very important. We will retake Gaza. And there will be lots of casualties. Very interesting. Here, remember, protesting outside Netanyahu or outside the ministry for Netanyahu's resign and, and stating on the record on the 8th of October that Netanyahu had been propping up Hamas for years. Now it blew up in their faces. Not you get it. I mean, it's the same. It's obvious what we're saying here. It's just amazing how Americans, and especially on the, the fervor of the, the back and forth political paradigm, just can't recognize the basic facts of the situation. Now, we're going to finish today with a very, very controversial and important point. Interestingly enough, it's so controversial, yet you can look it up right on Wikipedia. Isn't that interesting? So, Dan Cohen, yet again, points out that Ezra Yachin was a member of the, I think it's Lee Party, or not Party, but Lee or Lay, the, the Zionist terrorist group that twice, Twice attempted to ally with Nazi Germany. So a, a founding entity of the Zionist movement that founded Israel twice tried to align itself with Nazi Germany. Make sense of that for me. And sought to found a copycat fascist state. On January 11th, 1941, Vice Admiral Rolf von, uh, von der Marwitz, a German naval attache in Turkey, filed a report conveying, conveying, conveying excuse me, an offer by Lee or Lay to actively take part in the war on Germany's side in return for German support for, quote, the establishment of a historic Jewish state on the, a national and totalitarian basis bound by a treaty with the German Reich. Make sense of that. The only way you can make sense of that is when you understand that it was not about, one, Judaism or defending the Jewish people, but ultimately about, at any cost, creating a Zionist state under the guise of creating a Jewish state as Orthodox Jews will tell you at any time you want to listen in the specifically the Torah Jew, Jew, uh, Torah Judaism party that is all over the world in Israel, in the New, New York, UK and all around the world telling you that that's the reality as they get beat up by the IDF on a regular basis. Now here, just in case there's going to be people that are going to scream. Oh, and that, Oh, that's right. I forgot. I wanted to play this too. This, the Middle East eye points out Ezra Yachin, who's the one he's talking about here was a member of the Lee Party, a, a, a group, a Zionist terrorist group that literally it went in, in the beginning called their own members terrorists. I'll show you from Wikipedia. Or, yeah, Wikipedia. Here he is saying something today. Right now, he's apparently the, long, the oldest living reservist. He says, these animals can no longer live. And yeah, he's talking about Palestinians, not just Hamas. A 95-year-old Israeli army reservist is seen inciting every Jew with a weapon, that's his quote, to kill Palestinians and erase the memory of them. That's what he's saying. Not hard to understand why when you realize where he comes from. I'll make sure I didn't, uh, let's see. I don't have a gun. Hold on. I think I forgot to grab it. Oh, wait, I think it might be in a... Yeah, it's in, it's in a subtitle, so we'll read it here. Be triumphant and finish them off, he said. And don't leave anyone behind. Erase the memory of them. Erase them, their families, mothers, and children. So let's not pretend we're talking about Hamas here. These animals can no longer live. He's talking to a group of, of other 
soldiers. Nowadays, he says we have no excuse. Tomorrow, Hezbollah could send airstrikes on us. Yeah, another place that Israel's illegally occupying. And the Arabs here could attack us, Hezbollah being Lebanon, or you know, a group that operates within Lebanon. And he said the Arabs can attack us. So we have no excuse. Every Jew with a weapon should go out and kill them. Arabs, guys. Arabs. He didn't say Hamas. He said both Hezbollah and Arabs, right? They can attack us. And then goes on to say we should kill them all. If you have an Arab neighbor, don't wait. Go to his home and shoot him. How can anybody defend this? Not, not Hamas, any neighbor that's, a, that's an Arab. Attack them and don't wait for them. And realize, just because an Arab doesn't even make them Palestinian. Doesn't even matter. This is pure, seething, unadulterated racism. Hatred, bigotry. He said, uh, attack them and don't wait for them to fire airstrikes at us. And for the Iron Dome to activate, which is a complete sham that we've shown that didn't work at all this whole time, which I think has been used as a lie to justify attacks on Palestine for a very long time, my opinion. Attack them before that. Oh, yeah, some, some classic good old preemptive self-defense, right? We want to invade. We want to invade, which, by the way, that's what I think is a, what's going on right now. Not like before, he says. We want to enter and destroy what's in front of us. So he's telling you what they actually are trying to do. And destroy houses, then destroy one after another. He's telling you on the record what they want to do and what they're currently doing as they pretend they're trying to Hamas alone. And your government is lapping it up because they don't care either, because they know what's going on. He says, with all of our forces, complete destruction. Complete destruction, enter and destroy. That's what Lindsey Graham is telling you. Level it all. As you can see, he says, we will witness things we've never dreamed of. Let them drop bombs on them and erase them. All the prophecies sent by the prophets. Right, exactly, because this is a religious war. And there are prophecies about the Temple Mount and the reality of what they say that means. And it's a whole conversation. But that's terrifying that these people are being driven by what they believe is prophecy, at least he is, and that they're openly calling for the active murder of any Arab for any reason. That should scare everybody, guys. Now, the point again, this guy was a member of the Lee Party, which is a Zionist terrorist group that twice attempted to align itself with Nazi Germany. So for those that are acting like that can't be true, again, not that Wikipedia means that it's absolutely true, but the point is it means mass adoption. So I would argue very clearly that if this was not something that was verifiable history, that people would be losing their minds about the fact that it's written this way because Wikipedia can be changed at any moment. And also because you can easily look this up just about anywhere. You ready? Because most people are going to blow, this is going to blow people's minds, even though it's something you should know because it's public information. Lee was a Zionist paramil. Oh, it says, uh, well, it doesn't even, that's hard. It doesn't really show me the, it says L-E-X-I. I don't, so, I don't know. You guys tell me, is it Lee or is it Lie? In any case, the point is, this was a Zionist paramilitary militant organization. Now, its, av it, it's avowed aim was to evict the British authorities from Palestine by use of violence, allowing unrestricted immigration of Jews and the formation of a Jewish state. It was initially called the National Military Organization in Israel upon being founded in August 1940, but was then renamed Lee one month later. Lee, Lee, whatever it is. The group referred to its members as terrorists. Now, these are all cited. And you can look at the links for this coming directly. This is from uh, this one was uh, Intelligence and National Security. It says, and they admitted to having carried out terrorist attacks. So when people talk about the foundation of Zionist, Zionist Israel, the, the state of Israel being founded by terrorism, it's a simple, provable fact. Lee split from the Ergun militant group, which we just talked about, was also a very, very serious Zionist paramilitary terrorist group. It says they, they, in 1940, they split with that group in order to continue fighting the British. So interestingly enough, the found, fa founding entity of the state of Israel was fighting the British Empire. It initially sought an alliance with fascist Italy and Nazi Germany. Two different fascist entities, just because it was all about control. Lee twice attempted to form an alliance with the Nazis, proposing a Jewish state based on, quote, nationalist and totalitarian principles. Sure as hell got it. 
and linked to the German Reich by an alliance. After Stern's death in 1942, the new leadership of Lee began to move towards support for, for, guess who? Joseph Stalin. It's interesting how they're going after all the historical evil people of the world, at least how we frame it, right? How does that make sense? And the ideology of, the, of national bol, uh, Bolshevism, which is an important point. Regarding themselves as revolutionary socialists, the new Lee developed a highly or, original ideology combining an almost mystical belief in greater Israel, which we'll talk about with support for the Arab liberation struggle. Now, the idea of Bolshevism and how that ties in is something that I, I've researched, but I'm not the best person to go into that in depth. And there's plenty of people that have made important videos about the overlap there that you should watch. Now, it says, in April of 1948, Lee and the Ergun were jointly responsible for the massacre in Dyer Yassin of at, of at least 107 Palestinian Arab villagers, including women and children. This is the history, and it's still happening today. On 29th of May, 1948, the government of Israel, having inducted its activist members into the Israeli Defense Forces, formally disbanded Lee. So understand that sentence. Just like we're pretending in the Azov movement, which, by the way, you shouldn't miss, is also directly tied to Israel. Because we, and again, I'll just grab this since people never believe that for some reason. By the way, hold on. Right there where rights groups demand that Israel stop arming neo-Nazis in Ukraine. What do you know? Literally, the Azov movement we're talking about. Here it is. Oh, my. They changed this article. <laughs> of course they did. I'm going to look at this later. I can tell because of the organization of the paragraphs. They, they changed, deleted, or added something. Classic. Even though it's from 2018. The point is, the Azov movement is what they're talking about. Ask yourself why it makes sense that the the group fighting against all of the anti-Semites in the world or how they frame it are working with the most open embodiment of Nazis and neo-Nazis and fascists in the world. Maybe short of the Israeli government and the United States government and the rest of them. But the point is that they said, having inducted the activists, members of this movement, the terrorist movement, into their IDF, then they formally disbanded it. And it says, though some of its members carried out one more terrorist act, the assassination of Folk Bernadette some months later, who appears to be a Swedish nobleman. I'm sure nothing ever happened in response to that, like no accountability. But the point is, they became part of it. So when they pretend that the Azov movement was disbanded, it's not the truth. The Azov movement immersed with the government and they pretended it went away. It did not. Same thing here. After the assassination, the new Israeli government declared Lee a terrorist organization. Of course, right? Because now you've already brought them into your fold. Now you pretend like, we don't like them. They're bad guys. But they're part of you now. Arresting some 200 of the members and convicting some others. But remember, they already joined the IDF. Now it says, just before the first Israeli elections in January 1949, which is one year later, a general amnesty to Lee members was granted. So that was all a show is the point. You bring them into the IDF, you then pretend like they're going to arrest a bunch of them, and then the same year you go, well, amnesty. You're all forgiven. In 1980, all that time later, Israel instituted a military decoration. And, a, it's, and quote, an award for activity in the struggle for the establishment of Israel, which is called the Lee Ribbon. Let's not pretend like this is not a glorified part of their history, guys, from the Israeli Zionist government. Former Lee leader... Yitzhak Shamir even became the Prime Minister of Israel in 1983. That's all you need to see, guys. The reality of the Zionist background, both acting with terrorism, attacking their own people, which is actually an important clip I'm going to play right now. Because we need to understand how clear this history is and how afraid people have been to talk about it. Here again is Avi Shalom telling you what the Zionists were doing to Jewish people to get them into the state they wanted to create. Jews were convinced that Israel had a hand in uprooting them. After the 1948 war, there was mounting popular hostility towards the Jews in Iraq. Five bombs exploded in Jewish sites. The series of bombs created a panic which led more and more Jews to register to leave the country. I met an elderly friend of my mother's, uh, an Iraqi Jew called Yaakov Karkukli, who had been in the Zionist underground. One member of his group, Yosef Basri, a very, very intelligent uh, Jewish lawyer, 
and his assistant, Shalom Saleh Shalom, were responsible for three out of the five bombs. Basri's controller was an Israeli intelligence officer named Max Binet, who was based in Tehran. Right. That is important to understand that these were Zionists who were bombing Jewish people in order to get what they wanted. Now, there's a bunch of other videos I could play. I mean, I might, actually I might just play one more in regard to the important points that he's always including in all of this. Zionism is racism. Israel cannot be both. Israel is either a racist Jewish state or it's a democratic state for everybody. And that's what I would like Israel to be. I'd like a democratic solution, one state with equal rights for um, uh, all its inhabitants. Uh, your organization, Human Rights Watch, issued a report last year uh, about Israel, mm -hmm. and the conclusion was it is an apartheid state. And, and there are four major human rights groups in the last two years mm -hmm. who issued similar reports reached the same conclusion. Israel mm -hmm. is an apartheid state. So apartheid is racism. Apartheid is discrimination. But Israel is the only member of the United Nations that I know which is officially racist. And I say this because of the uh, July 2018 nation state law, which says mm. the Jews have a unique, unique right to self-determination mm -hmm. in Israel. Unique means exclusive. Yes. It means Arabs have no right to self-determination. Mm -hmm. It means even if Arabs became a majority, mm -hmm. they would still have no right to self-determination. Mm. So but most certainly Zionism is a, um, is a racist ideology mm -hmm. and it is largely responsible for the Anakba that has unfolded throughout the last century mm -hmm. and continues today. Exactly. Now he's a very well-respected historian, academic, British-Israeli. Very clear. And that's the history. And we just get yelled at by people that don't want you to remember. Now, I pointed this out many times. This was when they passed the nation state law. And a member of the a TV star tried to stand up and defend people saying it was racist. And the TV star said, no, no, Arabs are just as equal. They're equal citizens in this country. And then, of course, Netanyahu took to the stage, in, you know, uh, metaphorically, and said, Israel is the nation state of the Jews alone. And nobody even batted an eye. That's what he's talking about. That's why officially racist. If you and, and that's the point to people in, in TV going, no, 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 it's equal. And he literally said, no, you're wrong. It's only for the Jews. How do you not recognize what's going on? And then, of course, we shouldn't forget that the Zionist element of this is using that to manipulate people. That's probably why that's ultimately happening. And I could play a 50,000 videos of the Torah Judaism group and showing you how they're talking about this. But you guys have seen plenty of them. So just kind of to wrap up in general, I want to make sure we understand when they mention the Greater Israel Project, right? All right, there's all this, there's so many points to go into. People are bringing up the Samson option, which is a real thing. The argument of the idea that they would end up blowing you know, nu nuclear holocaust essentially for the world if they end up losing in general. Like these are, but that doesn't always mean that that's exactly the reality. You can bring up things like Operation Northwoods for the United States and just realize that it's a real plan, but whether or not it was actually going to be carried out, you know, in my opinion, the answer is yes. But the point is being objective, you just don't know. Uh, that's the story behind that, if you don't know, is that and it's easy to look up, look up Operation, Operation Northwoods. I believe it was presented to JFK from, from the military, the head of the heads of the military. And the argument was to carry out attacks against American civilians, murder, death, bombs in, in, inside America to, to blame on Cuba, I believe. And the point, and he turned it down. Thank God. But the point is that they were willing to do that. That should not be missed on people. We're watching stuff today. Now, greater Israel was something that was mentioned in the earlier point about the history of this. And the point is that what their original mindset is, as, well, really, at first, as refers to the historic or desired borders of Israel, which includes the territory of Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, Jordan, and, of course, Palestine. Isn't that interesting when you stand back and look at what's going on? All of the interesting foreign policy dilemmas and all of these interesting locations? Hard not to miss the reality when you understand the history. Now, again, let's not forget the idea that they were just saying in March that this is, then we take retake Gaza. 
And yes, with many casualties. You can't miss that. Let's not also not forget in the whole bigger conversation that in 2014, Holocaust survivors and their descendants openly accused Israel of genocide against the Palestinians. You can't make sense of that without realizing the true history. The reality that what they're doing is the same. I mean, ultimately, these people are what they claim they're fighting. And the Zionist government is what I'm talking about. More than 300 Holocaust survivors and their descendants have condemned what they describe as Israel's genocide of Palestinian people. I mean, this is no different than Holocaust survivors coming out during COVID-19 and saying this is worse than what people went through then. And you can disagree with that, but that's their opinion, people that were there. And here they are saying what they're doing is genocide. You can't pretend this is not what's happening. Now, I'm going to include this. I've actually played both of these videos for you already. Syrian girl shares both of them. This one's weirdly zoomed in for some reason, but it is a real video. And it's the leaked video of him on that couch talking with uh, looks like family members or people just discussing. He says, America is something you can easily maneuver and move it in the right direction. In 2001, he said that, quote, we have the Senate and we have the Congress and the record strong Jewish lobby. 1980 Netanyahu brags about Israel's control over the United States for the last 40 years. Don't remember, remember, we just saw a member of U.S. Congress show up in his IDF uniform. No other country would that ever be allowed. Like, I think about how wild it is to pretend it's okay to be not let alone uh, dress up in another country's me me military uniform, let alone be a part of their military. That just blows my mind. And again, after the point we just heard about swaying public opinion, he says, after 9-11, Netanyahu says 9-11 terror attacks, good for Israel. This is per Haaretz the Israeli mainstream outlet, saying he said it benefits from the attack because it swung public opinion. Lastly, I'll end on a clip from Judge Napoleano talking to Philip Giraldi, former CIA, telling you that Netanyahu is a criminal, that he's a thief, he's a liar, and that everybody knows it. My personal opinion, I think Bibi Netanyahu is uh, is capable of anything. Uh, he's a liar. He's a thief. He basically, uh, as far as as far as I believe, uh, the Israelis knew about 9/11 before it happened. They didn't warn the United States. Their closest and best ally, or they were part of it, which seems to be what the facts show. But same point either way. And they allowed 3,000 Americans to get killed because Netanyahu felt. It would tie the United States to Israel in terms of its war on terror, and he felt it was a good thing. That's my judgment, based as an intelligence officer at that time, that that is basically what occurred. So I don't, I, I give uh, Netanyahu no credit for humanity or anything else, and uh, I think he's quite capable of killing some of his own people uh, to to get what he wants. Well, it's hard not to hear that and recognize how it connects to everything else we're talking about. Believe he would kill some of his own people to get what he wants. Simple as that. And I think we need to realize how that's exactly the same thing that Americans are dealing with in this country because we've already lived through it and we're literally currently living through it. This is amazing. Well, thank you for tuning in again tonight, guys. I'll be, I'll be uh, interviewing James Corbett tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Central Time. So make sure you tune into that. I might be doing something in the day tomorrow, but I have a lot I got to get to in my own life. But the, this, this is just too important right now. I really think this is something that we need to keep on. And as I said, I am still keeping track of plenty of other things and I will be doing other content, but I, I'm going to go with my gut on what I think th this needs to be. We're in the middle of a massive information battle with just this topic right now. And it's the reason I feel like it's so relevant and so immediate is because that war potentially could immediately save civilians that are being slaughtered right now in Gaza because it's happening in real time, bombing as we're doing this show, killing civilians indiscriminately. And I'm hoping that if we continue to push and continue to wake people up, at the very least, we can stop it from happening again, but maybe save some people now because that's all we're really trying to do. And that goes both ways as Israeli Israelis feeling that they're being sacrificed because the, all of this is leading to civilian suffering. And that's what we're trying to stop. So if you want to help support this platform, guys, there's a lot of ways to do it. There's our donation portal on the website, our Substack, or buy me a coffee or subscribe star. You can support us via autonomy by subscribing in general using our links or our objective program, and you get access to a whole bunch of stuff. 
or just direct donation. I think it's important that we support, if it's not us, independent media that you believe is fighting for the truth. I personally feel very proud of what we've been doing for a very long time. And I think that our record stinks, speaks for itself. The way, I, the way I was thinking about it the other day is, you know, like right, like right now, for example, on the 8th, let's say, very few people were willing to jump into this and discuss this with no filter. Just the facts and what we thought we could prove. And, you know, our opinions, of course, but based on the evidence in front of us, even though that put people that made people uncomfortable, may show put people in positions where they attacked you and thought you were a terrorist or they just said that anyway. My point was that does not deter me from the truth. It's important to stick to your guns, stick to your principles in the midst of the hardest discussion. That's what I say about journalists in the, in the whole conversation. If you can't put aside your emotional reactions, then you shouldn't be in that position. You could feel things, but you need to realize that it should not influence your due diligence. And my point is, whether it's COVID-19, this topic, or anything we've covered before, I see myself as the trailblazer, or at least I try to be, in going into the conversation and finding out the path, hacking down all of the garbage and going through all the manipulators. And then typically, as we've at least so far, and this is why I want to get large enough to the point to where it's something people can't ignore, you get the bigger people that come through and walk down the path and go, look, at this is where we should go. And everybody looks there. And usually without all the source material and out of the context. And, and that's usually how they get lost. My point is we're trying to be that trailblazer. And it's not important to us to always be the one getting pointed at as long as people recognize what's really going on. But if they don't get the source material and the context and all the information along with the path that's going in the right, then it's not the same thing, right? As we've said many times in the past, they don't really care what, what, answers you find if they get you asking the wrong questions. So if you want to support this platform, please do because we need your support to grow and continue fighting. But at the very least, just make sure you share the content, get it in front of people who need to see it, clip this up, break it out, put it wherever you want, get it in front of people because people are dying as we speak. And that's something I'm just not okay with. And I don't think anybody should be okay with, especially with all the information proving that this is not what needs to happen or more so that it's something that is being made to happen for the benefit of something, a power structure that we've seen continue to do this repeatedly throughout history with no accountability. And it's time that changed. Thank you for tuning in. I love you all. As always, question everything. Come to your own conclusions. Stay vigilant. I mean, where, when were Palestinians born? What was, all, what was all this area before the First World War? When Britain got the mandate over Palestine, what was Palestine then? Palestine was then the area between the Mediterranean and the Iraqi border. You say there is no such thing East as East and West Bank, no. East and West Bank was Palestine. I'm a Palestinian. 